Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started in a couple minutes. Um, I want to welcome everybody. And as you can see, for those of you here, we have a table set up. So hopefully that works better for those of you who bring laptops or books and just um, you have some room to spread out. We wanted to do that at the March meeting, but unfortunately, we weren't able to. And speaking of the March meeting, for those of you who were here, we do have the auditorium for both days. <laughs> Yay! It was kind of chaotic for those of you who may not have been here. We had to move um, the rooms. So I am waiting for a couple new staff that I wanted to introduce. And they uh, were at the registration table in the lobby, so you may have seen them. But I'll just hold off until they get here. Meanwhile, we have Noelle Manlove over there. Noelle, you want to wave to everybody? And Michelle Joshua. So they will be, uh, <laughs> we've got the queen wave going on. They will be advancing our slides. OK, and here they are. As they enter the room, I can put them on the spot. <laughs> I'd like to introduce our newest CMS analyst to the meeting. That's Paula Dupay. Paula, wave so they know which one you are. <laughs> and Andrea Hazley. So Andrea had joined um, CMS in March. It was right after the CNM meeting, so unfortunately she couldn't be with us at that time. And Paula joined CMS in April. So we welcome both of them, and we're going to take it easy on them <laughs> today. <laughs> Go ahead and have a seat, ladies. Yep, you can sit wherever you like. OK, so similar to the March meeting, <laughs> we will allow approximately 10 minutes for each clinical presentation. And I'd like to draw your attention over to Noelle's table. We also have the two-minute warning sign that either Noelle or Michelle will be holding up in case the uh, time is running close for the clinical presenter. So you want to keep your eye over there. And um, we will make sure that this uh, runs, in, runs in a timely manner so we can get through all the presentations today. Uh, if you're following along in the packet, I'd like to bring your attention to the timeline on page 7 and the date of November 8th is the deadline for public comments on the proposals that are being discussed today. Also, if for some reason any of you are planning to submit a request for the March 2020 meeting, those requests are due by December 6th. And registration for the March meeting will open February 7th next year. So those are all bolded for you in the timeline. And there's a lot of other detailed information on the timeline that I would encourage you to review if you're not very familiar with the process. I will be going over just very briefly some highlights. We're now on page 11, if you're following along. So for those of you that are new to the process, this is a public forum. It's co-chaired by both CMS and CDC. Donna, you want to wave to folks over there? So we have the CDC staff as well. They will be presenting later this afternoon. And we're um, presenting the coding proposals and allowing the public to comment on these proposals. As I mentioned, the proposals that are being discussed today will be considered for implementation on October 1st of 2020. We don't make any final decisions at this meeting, but we will discuss the coding options and encourage you to comment and also to submit your comments via email. The comments, again, are due by November 8th. And to CMS, you see the email address listed there, ICD procedure code request at cms.hhs.gov. And for diagnosis comments, you want to send those to nchsicd10cm at cdc.gov. Once the proposals are presented and we receive the public comments and review them, once approved, then you would see those in what we call our Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. We refer to these Table 6s. So codes from the September meeting last year were on display in the um, April Notice of Proposed Rulemaking this year for fiscal year 2020. And then at the March meeting, because those proposals are not finalized in time to include in the proposed rule, we post what we call a final addenda. It's usually in either late May or early June. And so we make that available on our website. And then you see the other assignments in the final rule. But we do not discuss uh, payment or DRGs at this meeting. 
Okay, moving further down, um, let's see. Again, um, it's a public meeting. It's um, very informal. Uh, we provide different options for people to participate. We have folks here in the audience participating in person. We have our conference lines that you can um, either dial in and listen to the audio or you can watch the live web stream. Um, one thing I do want to mention is that if you click on the link for the WebEx um, option, that you will not be able to see the slides, okay? So you have to view the slides through the webcast. Um, again, no matter how you participate, we do encourage you to send in the written comments. And um, again, the December 6th is the deadline for submitting your topics for the March 2020 meeting if you have any requests for updates to those. Okay, moving on, we're gonna go ahead and proceed to our first topic. It's on page 13 of your handouts. The topic is intraoperative near-infrared fluorescence imaging of the hepatobiliary system using indocyanine green dye. So the issue is currently there are no unique ICD-10 PCS procedure codes to describe this imaging with the ICG dye. This is not a new technology add-on application related request. Uh, do we have Dr. Brian Smith? I'd like to go ahead and introduce him for the clinical presentation. To the right, you can advance mm -hmm. that way. And if you need the pointer, it's a little green button. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Yep. okay, good morning. Thank you for having me. Can I have my first slide up, please? Excellent. So my name is Brian Smith. I'm a general surgeon here representing Stryker Endoscopy and Novadac, which is now one merged company. And I'm hopeful that I can spend a few minutes helping educate you a little bit more about intraoperative near-infrared fluorescence imaging of the hepatobiliary system using ICG for visualization. So if I may take just one moment and provide a little bit of clinical context as to what the purpose of this technology is. It's important to understand a little bit of what a cholecystectomy is and why we do it. It's, it represents surgical removal of the gallbladder. It's the most frequently performed gastrointestinal surgery in the United States these days. A little more than 1.2 million people have their gallbladders removed annually for gallbladder disease, which is not just having stones, but having stones and related symptoms. And so the way we take this out nowadays is really with laparoscopy, and we grab the, the fundus of the gallbladder and we lift it up and lift the liver up with it, and we look for the cystic duct, which is the drain to the gallbladder, and we want to place two or three clips across this duct and then transect it here and then carve the gallbladder off of the liver. Now, one of the real challenges with this is while this may look very simple anatomically when drawn up here, it is not that difficult for a surgeon to misidentify the cystic duct and actually be looking at the common bile duct. If the cystic duct is not pulled out laterally and separated sort of longitudinally away from the common bile duct, and the common hepatic duct, a surgeon may inadvertently recognize this duct here, thinking it's a cystic duct, and make the transection here, which represents a common bile duct injury, a pretty significant injury, as I will explain. So the, the problem before us is this is a very common operation, but yet there are still approximately 5% of major morbidity uh, that occurs in these cases. And duct anatomy misidentification during surgery is certainly the most a consequential complication one can suffer. Bile duct injury rates are about three in every thousand patients that have this operation performed. And when you consider how many we do annually in the United States, it's not an insignificant number of patients that, ha that suffer this injury. There's actually a fairly good study done out of our university that looked at the consequences of having a major bile duct injury. These include a significant cost 
to the system, nearly $600,000, almost $700,000 if you have to have surgery to reconstruct your bile duct, an average hospital length of stay of almost 12 days, uh, and in fact, most of these cases have unusual anatomy. Up to 25% of patients will be found to have aberrant biliary anatomy, which is quite common in the population. Uh, in fact, bile duct injury has been studied so extensively that we can say statistically with fact that if you suffer a bile duct injury, you will likely have a shortened lifespan. Uh, there's significant long-term disability that comes along with that as well. And there was a paper put out a little bit earlier this year, and I, I failed to include it in my, my uh, notations here. It was uh, published in the Annals of Surgery, and it took one of the larger malpractice uh, databases out there, the CRICO database, which represents about 30% of all malpractice claims, and it looked at just biliary injuries alone in that database. And what they found was that bile duct injuries represented 53% of all biliary related uh, uh, claims in that database. Uh, and what was most disturbing is that bile duct injury, injury rates over the last 30 years have remained relatively stable. They jumped when we converted from doing this operation open to doing it laparoscopically. But the problem is they have, despite people getting better and better at laparoscopy, our rates are relatively stable for the last three decades. And in fact, this, stud, this paper was actually able to look at what are some of the financial consequences that come from bile duct injuries. For every dollar paid out, another 54 cents will be paid to the lawyers and administrative fees. And this also has significant impact on surgeon in, surgeons that are involved in these claims, including burnout, depression, suicidal ideation. And the perceived threat of medical malpractice is certainly highest among surgeons. So bile duct injuries are a fairly significant problem in 2019. So we, there, it turns out we do have some options in terms of trying to improve our safety in the operating room and improve our ability to visualize the anatomy, and that is with the use of ICG. So fluorescence describes really light being absorbed and then readmitted at a lower energy but higher wavelength so that you can actually inject ICG into the bloodstream. It is captured by plasma proteins and held onto by them. Uh, the, the ICG will then absorb near infrared light shown by a laparoscope during surgery and then readmit it at a slightly different wavelength, which is then picked up and processed uh, electronically so that effectively what this does is it creates a roadmap for our bile ducts during surgery and allows us to better identify anatomy that is often typically covered by a fair amount of fatty tissue over the bile duct structures. So it takes what is uh, somewhat more obscure and turns it into something much more like what I showed you at the beginning, which is a drawing with fairly or much more clear anatomy. So uh, Pinpoint is uh, FDA cleared uh, specifically for extra, extra hepatic biliary ducts uh, including the use of intraoperative cholangiography. Now, cholangiography historically has been used to describe the use of x-rays and dye injected into the bile ducts in order to image the biliary tract and understand the anatomy better. And what this really does is the ICG is excreted out into the bile ducts and then fluoresces when near-infrared light is shown on it intraoperatively. So it allows us to image the bile ducts very well without having to actually get into the bile ducts to inject radiopaque dye for an x-ray. So I would love to have shown you a, a fantastic and dazzling video, but unfortunately I was limited to still shots. And so what you can appreciate here is ICG lighting up the gallbladder very nicely. Uh, and you can see it in counter distinction to the liver tissue behind it. And ultimately what we're looking to do is be able to sort of identify through a lot of this fatty tissue that typically covers the bile ducts uh, a more clear anatomy of what is the true cystic duct and where does it join the common bile duct. Because when a surgeon misidentifies that anatomy, that is when bile duct injuries occur. No, no surgeon consciously cuts a, bile, uh, a common bile duct. They're always looking to cut a cystic duct. And when injuries occurs, it is almost uniformly an error of identification. So how can ICG 
cholangiography potentially increase safety? Well, there's a number of different ways. Uh, it, as I mentioned, it really helps define the duct anatomy, which is the key to avoiding missteps and misidentification. It can be accomplished in more patients compared to intraoperative col conventional cholangiography with radiology. What we typically would do in the past is you make a small cut in the duct and you insert a catheter and you shoot some dye in and then you take an x-ray and that's a true sort of gold standard intraoperative cholangiogram. However, it requires a cut in a duct in order for you to get that catheter in. That you, you cannot always get that catheter in, most of the time you can, but occasionally the anatomy is such that it's not easy to feed the catheter in. So not every patient can successfully have a true intraoperative x-ray cholangiogram. And you also have to cut a duct in order to get a catheter in. So if you've already misidentified the duct, the duct that you're cutting to put the catheter in to define the anatomy now has a cut in it. And so one of the advantages to ICG is you don't have to actually get into a duct in order to be able to image it. Uh, it is hence less expensive than cholangiography because you don't require an x-ray machine or an x-ray tech or the intraoperative time used for that. Uh, and it is an excellent teaching tool. As an educator myself and a program director, I care very deeply that my trainees do not proceed unless they very clearly understand their anatomy. Um, again, it's incisionless. I don't have to cut a duct in order to be able to image them. Um, it has an exceptional safety record in the form of ICG. ICG has been around since 1959, a wonderful safety record. Um, and again, we don't require any radiation exposure to the patient here in order to accomplish this. And in fact, there's a, a large body of evidence that, that has effectively shown that ICG cholangiography is safe and effective and may, may, reduce biliary tract injuries. What we lack right now is prospective evidence to prove definitively that it does so, but you would require such an enormous study in order to be able to show that a rate of three in a thousand is brought down lower than that with the use of intraoperative ICG that a prospective study may not ever be able to effectively be able to be accomplished. And so uh, we, the Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons has actually put forth a fairly significant effort to try try and get uh, surgeons to consistently utilize intraoperative imaging in order to maximize safety. And this is one additional adjunct to doing so beyond just using conventional x-rays. And so uh, this is, I'm hopeful, going to become the standard of care in the future that every patient have this safety feature utilized during their operation. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, I just want to let you know, when the time comes and somebody does stand up at the microphone, you need to please turn the microphone on and announce yourself. <laughs> Moderator, can we open up the phone lines to see if there are any questions or comments for Dr. Smith? Moderator? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to go ahead and turn to the coding options. If you're following along, it's page 15 of the packet. Um, currently, there is uh, no code, which is why they're here to request one. Uh, you would simply report the cholecystectomy procedure. So coding option one is do not create a new ICD-10 PCS code to just continue coding the cholecystectomy procedure only. Option two would be to create a new imaging in section B called five, other imaging. And uh, we would also propose to create a new contrast value of two for a fluorescing agent and a new contrast qualifier value zero for the ICG dye to identify this near infrared fluorescence imaging of the hepatobiliary system during a cholecystectomy. And then you would also assign a separate code for the cholecystectomy procedure. So you can see what it would look like in the table. And at this time, CMS is recommending option two. Do we have any questions or comments on the coding options? We have Lynn. Can you turn it on? Okay. 
Yep, someone's coming to help you out. Sorry, very short. Lynn Keen, Keen Consulting. I just have one question about this new table that says other imaging. Um, was there some conscious reason why we needed that first row? Is it just for future expansion? I understand the second row completely, but I don't understand the first row. Yes, I, I think that is just consistent with the way the classification is, so it would be for future. Yes. Jean Yoder, Lidos, uh, for the Defense Health Agency. Um, I see we have fluorescing agent, and that makes sense because this is a fluorescing agent. And I, I was just wondering about uh, the additional uh, add zero uh, for the specific uh, color of dye. I mean, are there other types of fluorescing dye? Uh, and, and the thing is, I think it's a good idea um, to have the extra expandability here on the off chance that some other dye comes along that is even better or whatever. Uh, so I was wondering why we had the, the separate uh, uh, specific color of dye. <laughs> well, the, the request was specifically to identify the dye and, and there's room, so it, it's an available option. I can't answer the, the first question. That's more of a clinical question. I'm not uh, positioned to answer, so I don't know if um, Dr. Smith would want to answer the question about other types of dyes. You're talking about other fluorescent agents. If you want to go to the mic. So I would say uh, keeping the options open in the future for, for other technologies that come along is certainly reasonable, but ICG's been around for, we're talking almost 70 years now, and we really haven't, come, we haven't, had, we haven't had a better dye come along thus far. So uh, it, it's the, uh, it sort of begs the question, why hasn't it come along yet? But if there are other better, better imaging options in the future, uh, I think certainly having some available availability to expand to that is very reasonable. I mean, as Gene Yoder, Lidos, uh, Defense Health Agency again. Um, I mean, as an aside, it certainly will help the coders because it's like, oh, good, that, that's it, that's it, okay as opposed to not having anything in there. So that's a good thing, and I'm not objecting. I was just wondering why we had the fluorescing agent and then we had a specific uh, color. Okay. Thank, thank you, Jean. Glenn Jones, plastic surgeon. I think in answer to your question, there have been two dyes that we've used. One was fluorescein, which is ultraviolet uh, fluorescence, and that does not concentrate in the bile duct, whereas ICG does. And that's why when we first started working with ICG, which I've done for 12 years, it was the dye that we suggested might be useful in the biliary tract imaging. Thank you. Does that help, Jean? <laughs> Very good. Oh, got another. Back to short people. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add on to what Lynn said. Uh, I'm Linda Holtzman, Clarity Coding. Mm -hmm. um, I find, I understand that the first row here is uh, consistent with the classification, but I find it confusing. Like, okay. When, when would I use that as opposed to some of the others? So I would actually prefer, I have no objection at all to the proposal, it's probably a good idea, um, but just the way the code table is set up, I would just use the second row and ditch the first row because uh, I'm getting confused already, which isn't an unusual uh, <laughs> occurrence for me, but w when I would use that first row as opposed to some of the other tables. Okay. Uh, also, I did have a question for Dr. Smith, and I'm sorry I waited until after you sat down twice. Um, you said you expect this to become the standard of care, so this would be something that's routinely done with uh, every cholecystectomy. Okay. Okay. That that just raises some questions as to um, whether it might be considered integral. Again, I, I don't I don't object to to a code, but it's just your wheels are spinning. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Linda. If you could, and same goes for the other commenters, please submit your comments to the email address listed in the packet. Moderator, can we open up the phone lines? Yes. Thank phone you. Phone lines are now open. Do you have any questions on the phone lines? Just can take a couple. Okay, hearing none. 
Um, in the interim, you would continue to code the cholecystectomy procedure only. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Paula Dupay for the next topic. Good morning again. My name is Paula Dupi, and if you're following me along with the packet, I would like to direct your attention to page 16 of the agenda and handout packet. The topic is near infrared spectroscopy for tissue viability assessment. The issue, there's currently no unique ICD-10 PCS code to describe the utilization of near infrared spectroscopy tissue oxygenation imaging to measure or monitor tissue oxygen saturation levels when assessing tissue viability during surgical procedures or during the post-operative management period using an external approach that is non-invasive. This is not a new tech application topic. At this time, I would like to welcome to the podium Dr. Glenn Jones, Professor of Plastic Surgery at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Paula, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the privilege of the podium. I want to speak today about near-infrared spectroscopy and in modern-day plastic and reconstructive surgery, assessment of tissue perfusion and thereby tissue ischemia significantly affects the success of our outcomes. And hitherto, we've been at a loss for adequate modalities by which to assess tissue perfusion safely in a non-invasive manner. In the past, we used uh, fluorescein which was uh, ultraviolet-based, and then about 12 years ago, I started using the ICG-based technology, which is also invasive, but non-invasive technologies were lacking. And so we started exploring the opportunities to use other techniques, and one of those techniques which was developed in conjunction with the ICG technique about 12 years ago was that of near-infrared spectroscopy. And what this does is to measure tissue oxygenation, or the STO2, the saturation of oxygen in the tissues in superficial tissue beds similar to ICG at about two to three millimeters of depth. And what it is is a surrogate of perfusion. And these technologies may be completely non-contact, such as the Kent multispectral device which we're presenting today, or they may require contact with the skin like the Vioptics and Intraox te techniques. And the concept is that they are used to assess tissue health in a completely non-invasive manner. So this graphic here illustrates a human left hand, and what you're seeing in the black band is a finger tourniquet that has been rolled down the finger to exsanguinate it and remove the blood from the finger. So in the top left hand pane, you're seeing a well-perfused hand, red is good, blue is bad, and this is just seconds after the tourniquet has been applied. In the bottom left hand pane, you're seeing total hemoglobin, which this allows you to measure in addition to oxygenation. And then in the top pane on the right, you're seeing deoxygenated hemoglobin. And in the bottom pane down here, you're seeing oxygenated hemoglobin. And if this tourniquet is left on for a prolonged period of time, you can see this dark blue starting to appear. That finger will progressively become more blue as the deoxygenated hemoglobin rises. So unlike ICG, this enables us to measure not only the perfusion, but also the oxygenation and deoxygenated hemoglobin that accumulates, which can also be a reflection of poor venous outflow and obstruction to venous outflow, which is important in things like flap reconstruction or free flaps. So what this does is STO2 measures most closely the mixed venous and arterial oxygenation which you see in the capillary bed, which is what we're really interested in as reconstructive surgeons. By contrast, when you look at pulse oximetry, which we do have codes for, that only measures arterial oxygenation. So there's a difference between these two, and the capillary bed oxygenation is a more adequate surrogate of perfusion. <clears throat> So the applications for which this is used, for me as a reconstructive surgeon, particularly is breast reconstruction 
And techniques these days allow us to preserve not only the skin envelope in skin sparing mastectomy, but also the nipple in nipple sparing mastectomy. And so we're able to do far more adequate reconstructions provided that skin envelope is viable. We also use it in soft tissue reconstruction, for example, free flap head and neck reconstruction, limb salvage with the orthopedic service, and then the vascular surgeons, as they monitor re-post-vascularization effects of their procedures, can then demonstrate whether or not that vascularization is working, and the effects are almost immediate. So the concept is that you're using this to assess superficial tissues which are at risk for ischemia. The nice thing about it is it's portable, it's non-invasive, you can use it in the OR, the ICU, um, at the bedside, or in a clinic setting, and it's completely transportable, it's a tablet about this big. So here's an example of a patient with an ischemic foot, this is a diabetic, having had a great toe amputation on the right foot, you can see there is a dark blue area, which is suggestive of ischemia, that wound broke down, resulting in exposure of bone, the patient had a transmetatarsal amputation, and at the time of amputation, this dark blue area suggested that skin was going to break down, which in fact it did, and it developed necrosis. Now the alternative to technology is ICG-based, and that's something I've been involved with for over 12 years. I helped get involved in the development of it. It does require invasive injection of a dye and then video monitoring. It works very nicely. I've used it for many, many years. And it's similar applications to those that we're suggesting for the NIRS, but it is more invasive than the external approach and there have been a number of false positives that have been a concern to us. So here's a breast reconstruction I did last year, and what you're seeing on the right is the breast postoperatively. There's the nipple. This H area here was suggested on, on ICG-based technology to be relatively ischemic and should have been debrided. On near-infrared, it was suggested that it was alive. The only suspicious area was right there, and that's the area that developed very slight color change, but no blistering and no breakdown, and that skin fully survived. We then took that same technology and applied it as a comparison in a rat study. This was a study that was done many, many years ago when these two technologies were first developed in Canada. And we looked at it in a rat, and what you're looking here is the back of a rat. This is the tail, the head is up here. This is a long skin flap that has been raised, and blood flow is coming up through the parasacral arteries on either side of the spine. As you can see, this is at five minutes post-operatively. This is looking a little bit duskier than down here. This is what happens at three days, necrosis of the tip of that flap. And here you see the near-infrared image. Here is the ICG image, both of them showing similar amounts of necrosis. But what we found was that specificity was much the same. Sensitivity was higher with NIRS. We have subsequently done a clinical study, which this is about to be published next month in our journal, our national journal. We are now publishing a clinical study comparing breasts, about 70 breasts with the same sort of imaging, and find a similar sort of thing that we've got about an 8 to 10% improvement in the accuracy in regards to the sensitivity of near-infrared uh, spectroscopy. So, in conclusion, we feel that NIRS is an external approach that is a very safe, non-invasive way to measure and monitor tissue that is at risk of ischemia. Currently, we don't have codes to accurately describe this procedure, and we feel that a code is necessary to enable us as surgeons, physicians, and uh, wound care physicians and centers to be able to use this more effectively in the clinical setting. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Gene Yoder, Defense Health Agency. Um, so this would, could be done in, uh, in the operating room, and it could also be done at bedside? Correct. So, okay. Thank you. And also in the clinic, in the office. Okay. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions in the audience or on the phone lines for Dr. Jones? Nope. Thank you, Dr. Jones. At this time, I would like to direct your attention to page 18 of the agenda and handout packet for the coding options. The current coding is as follows. 4A03XR1, measurement of arterial saturation, peripheral external approach. 
4A13XR1, Monitoring of Arterial Saturation, Peripheral External Approach. Coding Option 1, do not create new ICD-10 PCS code to describe the utilization of near-infrared spectroscopy tissue oxygenation imaging. Continue current coding as listed. Option 2, in Section 8, other procedures, add the approach value external. Apply to the body region value 2, circulatory system, and the method value D near-infrared spectroscopy to identify external NEARS tissue oxygenation imaging. CMS recommendation, we are interested in receiving input from the public on the coding options. And at this time, open up the floor and the phone lines for questions. Any questions on the phone lines? The interim coding advice, continue to code as above under the current coding options. And again, we welcome you to submit questions or comments to our ICD-10 mailbox. If there are no further questions, I welcome Andrea Hazley to the podium. Good morning. Okay, for those following along with the handout, we are now on page 20. Uh, the topic is cesium-131 brachytherapy. The issue is that there are currently no unique ICD-10 PCS codes to describe the use of low dose rate cesium-131 brachytherapy seeds in the treatment of cancer in locations throughout the body. The requester is not submitting a new tech application at this time. So I would like to welcome William Cavanaugh, Chief Research and Development Officer of ISRA to the podium for the clinical presentation. All right, thank you, Andrea. Uh, thanks for uh, having me here and hearing me out this morning. Um, I do represent ISRA Medical. Uh, we manufacture and sell an isotope called cesium-131. I'm here to make the case that we need an ICD-10 code uh, to represent cesium-131 treatment, and I'll explain why, starting at the very general and moving uh, to the very specific. And again. Uh, there's very little dispute that complete surgical removal of a tumor is the, currently the best cancer treatment available to anyone. However, either uh, based on uh, the extent of a tumor um, after surgery or even for certain stages, um, uh, you know, in a, regardless, a surgical margin is left behind. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the problem is not a small one. Uh, when we look at uh, uh, sur uh, positive surgical margins, uh, Widely, they are a relatively common occurrence. And in order to address that situation, <coughs> we uh, have adjuvant therapies, either chemotherapy or radiation, to try to address those uh, positive surgical margins. <coughs> when we look at uh, radiation therapy, <coughs> we can divide that into, excuse me, uh, external beam therapy and brachytherapy. Brachytherapy being the application of radiation very close to the site of, of the target, of the tumor, the cancerous tissue in this example. Uh, for brachytherapy, we have both high dose rate applications and low dose rate applications. I'll focus on the low dose rate applications here. Um, well, first I'll focus on brachytherapy. Again, this is the application of radiation to a tumorous site as opposed to addressing it uh, from a, at a distance with a linear accelerator. <coughs> uh, for brachytherapy applications, we have high dose rate applications and low dose rate applications, and these are both a function of delivering dose. It's just a matter of over what time that dose is delivered. High dose rate applications are temporary. These are very high energy isotopes. They're applied for a very short period of time to get a dose. Low dose rate isotopes are 
uh, oftentimes implanted permanently and left to decay over time. Cesium-131, what I'm, uh, what I'm uh, discussing here is a low dose rate isotope. Um, the high dose rate isotopes, again, are very energetic, very uh, powerful, if you will, they're hazardous. They need to be contained, they need to be brought into an operating room, applied for a very short period of time. The low dose rate isotopes, uh, on the other hand, uh, deposit energy very close. They're very uh, low energy isotopes, um, relatively um, short half-lives. Uh, we have codes for all of the, uh, excuse me, for iridium-192, cesium-137, iodine-125. There exist ICD-10 codes for all of these, but not for cesium-131. Uh, I do want to make the point that cesium-131 is definitely not cesium-137, for which there does exist an ICD-10 code. Uh, cesium-137 is a, uh, a very uh, high energy, very, very long-lived isotope, um, sort of, uh, you know, the very, you know, difficult to contain isotope. Cesium-131, what I'm talking about here, is, uh, again, a very, very low energy emission can be easily shielded um, with, you know, some stainless steel, for instance. The human body can also shield it once it's introduced inside the body. Of the permanently implantable low-dose rate isotopes, like cesium-131, iodine-125, palladium-103, uh, these all three were introduced for the purposes of prostate brachytherapy. That's permanent implant seed brachytherapy, as it's commonly known. Uh, cesium-131 is the newest of these three, uh, introduced in, uh, only in the early 2000s has it been, uh, it's been available. Um, and you can see it has gone from the treatment of, of the prostate, uh, we, uh, it is now uh, used in the treatment adjuvantly, of, as I'm speaking here, like in the inpatient setting. Uh, for instance, a head and neck cancer treatment, a, uh, oftentimes a tumor is removed, um, adjuvant radiation is required again, to avoid this surgical uh, recurrence based on a positive margin. Uh, the um, head and neck being, an, uh, you know, a, a, a volume where a lot of radiation dose cannot be taken over, over the uh, patient's lifetime. Uh, Season 131 or any of these isotopes offer a, the opportunity to introduce adjuvant radiation in, in that setting. Uh, you can see we've also uh, gotten into the chest and, and various other areas, including inside the cranium for these very reasons. Uh, comparing cesium-131 to iodine-125 and palladium-103, cesium-131 uh, has physical attributes that are very desirable uh, for, for a variety of reasons over, over the two of those. Again, this is a unique and discrete isotope as compared to iodine-125, palladium-103, and as earlier mentioned, cesium-137 and the other uh, brachytherapy isotopes. Uh, again, these are, uh, you can see they, these are seeds, these are the grain of, you know, the size of a grain of rice, often introduced in preformed matrices uh, using implantable meshes and strands and so forth. These, these deliver a very compact dose um, that, that require very, requires very little time in the operating room to introduce. Um, again, the delivery approach is not novel or not new or not unique. Uh, however, the isotope contained in there, the, the emission that is therapeutic, is unique, cesium-131 versus the other uh, radioisotopes. Just a couple quick examples where we're seeing deployment along these lines. Again, adjuvant radiation therapy, cesium-131, uh, in, the, in the operative setting here, in the case of uh, uh, the removal of non-small cell lung cancers, uh, uh, when the chest is opened up or, or thoracoscopy is made. Oftentimes, the surgeon would like to perform that operation on the right, the lobectomy, a very definitive operation, but it's also an operation that leaves the patient uh, without an awful lot of desirable lung tissue uh, for purposes of ventilation. So in patients with compromised lung function, the, the operations on the left are performed. Uh, these are less than the lobectomy, but they do spare and, and, and allow, uh, you know, a more uh, healthy lung tissue uh, behind for the patient's breathing purposes. However, oftentimes this, this is associated with a positive margin, as I talked about earlier. Uh, in that case, cesium-131 meshes can be laid down to deliver that radiation dose very, in a very compact way. Uh, and again, this is cesium-131. This is where we're currently you know, seeing a lot of interest. Another area we're seeing a lot of interest is in the head and neck. I briefly touched on earlier where uh, these very tricky, tough to irradiate spots where cesium-131 uh, is, is garnering interest as a way to um, 
provide patients, uh, especially those who have been previously irradiated, with another adjuvant radiation oper uh, option following their uh, surgical resection. But again, this is always going to be in the inpatient setting. And I hope that I've, I've uh, you know, made the case. Uh, again, CZ-131, you'll see, I'm sure, in the coding options that for many isotopes, for this idea of adjuvant radiation therapy, codes currently exist. Uh, we are seeking one for CZ-131 in order to uh, distinguish it from, from the other isotopes available, uh, understanding that there is another other isotopes option. However, given, you know, increasing interest in this idea, what we're seeing uh, at ISORAY, we, you know, we would uh, respectfully request uh, a code be issued in. I'll answer any questions anyone has. Hi, um, I'm Linda Holtzman from Clarity Coding. I just wondered if you would be so good as to speak to the difference between low dose radiotherapy and high dose radiotherapy. We just, we see LDR and HDR uh, all over the place. I teach coding and sometimes um, my, my students have difficulty in understanding what the distinction is and how they will be able to tell. So if you could just speak to that clinically, thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, you know, the simplest answer is that uh, a, a high dose rate application of radiation therapy is something that is delivered uh, on the order of minutes. So that means the, 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 uh, the source is giving off uh, its energy, its therapeutic energy at such a high rate that when, in order to achieve a dose of, say, 100 arbitrary units, one would literally put it uh, in contact with the target for, on the order of minutes. Low dose rate radiation, on the other hand, is, is emitting its therapeutic radiation much more slowly. So you would a apply it to the surface to get 100 arbitrary units in, on the order of weeks to months. So, uh, so again, minutes versus weeks in terms of exposure time. Thank you. That was very helpful. So um, a particular uh, isotope could only be LDR or only HDR, or could the same isotope be either one, depending on how it's used? Conceivably, it could be either. Um, but low-dose rate uh, radioisotopes basically are constrained largely by their half-life. Well, right. they all are. Yeah, that's but, where I was going. But, but, the, but you could, by adding activity, by adding a lot of activity uh, of any isotope, you could get a faster treatment time uh, and therefore make it high dose rate. So a lot of it is, is, is also dependent on the amount of activity in that source. On a practical basis, is it, is it really more a matter that, you know, this particular isotope is typically LDR and this particular one is typically HDR? Um, yes. Um, yes. That, that, that's, and, and, but in terms of the low dose rate, such as cesium that I'm talking, cesium-131 mm -hmm. that I'm talking about here, um, its, its half-life is so fast that it's impractical to use as a high dose rate isotope because one would have to amass a very large amount right, of it. Right. It's decaying very quickly. Um, other isotopes like cesium-137, for instance, based on the amount of activity in the source, could be, could be used as, as an HDR source or at least a medium dose rate source or a low dose, dose rate source at a low activity. And I hope I'm not, I'm not uh, confusing your question there. Actually, I'm just looking for a way to, you know, for a cheat for my students. <laughs> you know, if you see this particular uh, isotope, it's typically LDR. If you see this isotope, it's typically HDR. So if you can't figure it out, you know, try this. Well, LDR, again, low dose rate oftentimes is, you know, again, a half-life issue and also an energy issue. Um, the cesium-137, for instance, and I'll again make a distinction. You, you referred to it as HDR earlier. Yes, I did. But cesium-137 has a half-life of, of 40 years. So, you know, it, you too. can keep it in a, in a box for a long time and keep using it with a lot of activity. Cesium-131 delivered for a sort of one-time shot. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it is very impractical to try to store it for a long period of time to, to have it perform a number of, uh, of therapeutic interventions, whereas 137 will stick around. Okay. Um, but it uh, you know, also has other problems in the high energy and so forth. So, okay. um, Thanks. We're good. Yeah, I oh, hope cool. that helps. Um, Nellie Lee on Chisane American Hospital Association. Forgive me, it's a little bit early and not enough coffee. So I want to make sure 
I heard you correctly. The difference between cesium-137 and 131 is that the 137 one is high dose, high dose rate? Um, often, yeah, medium to high dose rate. No, but cesium-137 could be used in a low dose rate setting, and I'm sorry if that caused some confusion there. Um, okay, because now I'm back to Linda's question. If I'm a coder and I see in the record cesium-137, how do I know whether, whether it's high dose or low dose? Because currently in the ICD-10-PCS tables for brachytherapy, cesium-137 is showing up in the, as low dose rate. Oh, it is? Okay. Um, and again, there, I mean, elementally, I mean, from just from a point of view of, of physicality, they are two very different things. Um, and, and, you know, from a nuclide uh, perspective, uh, you know, uh, periodic table, nuclide table, sort of an idea. Um, so they are just different, very, very different physically. Now, in terms of, of how they're, you know, you know, used, like cesium-137, for instance, used as a low-dose rate isotope, where it's actually put in place, it's still a temporary implant. And I guess maybe that's, maybe that's the best way to answer this question. If, if one is using the radiation therapy, the brachytherapy source, temporarily, meaning, you know, it's, it's, it's placed in, it's put in place, and with cesium-137 low dose rate, those can stay in place for days. But they're still temporary, because it still has to be removed. Oh, you, it has to be removed, so that's the key. Removed. Okay. All and right, so I was looking for something that a coder could hang their hat on, because we're not, we're not physicists, and I was going to say we're not that smart. Yeah, no, no, this is very helpful, actually, because okay. I, I want to make sure everyone understands. With cesium-131, again, it, you know, notwithstanding physical characteristics, it is left in place permanently to decay. So its dose is delivered over what we call the lifetime of the isotope. Anything that's, you know, not that, not permanent implant, is temporary, uh, which we could conceivably have low dose rate, medium dose rate, and high dose rate ideas. So I sh I'm, I'll drive that line on removable, temporary, and permanent. We're we'll just say it's, we're not going to not talk about dose rate for a second. Just the isotope cesium-131 is permanently implantable only. Cesium-137 could be high dose rate, low dose rate, but it's always temporary. So we're trying to. Sorry. Oh, no, no. Go, it, go, go, go. It's the same go. question that I was going on. Is, if it's left oh, in go, place, go, go, we go ahead because okay. I had a follow-up okay. question. Okay. Because because something the, else. The 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 coding mm -hmm. rules are kind of if you leave it in intentionally. Then it's coded, and it's and if you take it out, rate. and so in the high dose you got to put in and take out because yeah, I get it. okay. But the thing is, some people have this: how long is temporary? Some people say three days, some people say thirty days, and and so uh, we kind of have this. So for the high dose, would they be left in for approximately? I, some for seconds, I, and I remember, you know, they put the seeds in and then they take the seeds out, okay? That's high dose. Okay. That's high dose rate, right. and yes. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Like, like I said, I'm looking for a cheat here. I'm not, I'm not trying to understand the physics, which is why I didn't become a physicist, because I know it's beyond me. Um, so if something is left in permanently, you put it into the brain, or you put it into the prostate, or you put it into the lung, and it never comes out. Is that HDR or LDR, or is that the wrong question? It's 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 always LDR. So right. something but is the temporary is implant. The temporary implant is one that could be HDR or LDR. Let's okay. just say. But typically, if it's put in and then you take it out, it's typically HDR. Typically. I'm writing that down. Typically. Okay, and I'm sorry, I had a, a, a separate question. So I'm trying to understand whether these are different um, devices or we're talking about device versus isotope. So you're talking about cesium-131. Now there is already a code in existence under um, the insertion table where it talks about radioactive element cesium-131 collagen implant. So is that different from what we are looking at today? Is it because the other one is embedded in, in a collagen um, implant, where, whereas you're talking about just plain seeds by themselves? I mean, is that the difference? 
Yes, yeah, so the collagen implant is another, it's, it's a product, the, the gametile product, they call it, but, and it does have cesium-131 embedded in it, but that's you know, with, with a carrier and the biologic collagen and, and all is one, one delivery apparatus with isotope involved. And yes, you do have it right. When we look at you know, what I'm describing largely are surgical implants that are made you know, with usually not individual seeds, but seeds that have been stranded together or, or woven mesh together, um, but certainly not the level of sophistication of the as the collagen implant. OK, that's very helpful. Thank you. I really want to make sure I answered your question properly. Thank you, Mr. Kavanaugh. Do we have any other clinical questions? No. Okay, so at this time, I will go over our coding options. We're on the bottom of page 20 of our handout. Okay, currently, facilities report implant implantation of low dose rate cesium-131 brachytherapy seeds to the appropriate brachytherapy table in section D, radiation therapy with the fifth character modality qualifier B, low dose rate, and the sixth character isotope value of Y, other isotope. In addition, an ICD-10 PCS code from the root operation insertion tables in the medical and surg surgical section can be reported using the device value radioactive element to identify that the element was left in the body at the end of the procedure. So, um, our option one is do not create new ICD-10 PCS codes for cesium-131 brachytherapy. Continue in use, using current codes as described in current coding. Option two, in the radiation therapy section, create new isotope value six, cesium-131, apply to all brachytherapy tables for the fifth character modality value of B, low dose rate, to identify cesium-131 brachytherapy. In addition, report an ICD-10 PCS code from the root operation insertion tables in the medical and surgical section using the device value radioactive element to identify that a radio radioactive element is left in the body at the end of the procedure. Um, CMS's recommendation is option two. Um, I would like to open the floor for any, and the phone lines for any coding questions. I'm back. Um, first, I'd like to note that I um, have no objection at all to identifying cesium-131 separately. I think it's a good idea. Okay. So um, the, the only issue for me is, is how we do it um, in the code tables. And I, I just want to comment, I, I just spent like several hours trying to figure out the new guidelines on brachytherapy. I was so happy to see those guidelines created because I don't know if you remember this, Nelly. Uh, at a previous meeting, you were commenting on. And I thought to myself, thank God it's not just me. Um, it, it, it was so confusing on how we were supposed to code brachytherapy. So I was so glad to see the guidelines come out and explain to us, you know, if it's left in the body and you use this table and that table. But we now, or we will very shortly, have a new guideline that says. Um, the exception is cesium-131. And that doesn't take um, a code from um, section D radiotherapy, or radiation therapy, and also section zero medical surgical. It only takes a code from section zero. Okay, are we gonna get rid of that guideline? I don't believe so. I believe that guideline is referring to the use of the collagen uh, implant, the gametile. So this it's, would uh, be... So that's a, only for the collagen one. Yes. Okay. So implantation of cesium-131 brachytherapy. I'm, I'm reading the guideline now. Embedded in a collagen matrix. Okay. Yes. So that guideline will stay, but if you put in like seeds or something that's not in a collagen matrix... We follow. Then not the guideline. We would follow. Okay. Um, was there... Thank you very much, and thank you for clarifying that point. Um, are there, you know what, Lynn, I'm going to go think about this a little bit more. Okay, thank you. I'll try mine. Lynn Keen, Keen Consulting. Um, 
I'm also concerned about that same subject of coding the brachytherapy correctly. And if you look at table 00H, which is towards the top of that page 21, the only radioactive element, and I'm checking 2020 in front of me here on my iPad, there is no way to insert cesium-131, which is a non-collagen implant. So our new product here we're talking about today, we don't have plain radioactive element mm -hmm. in the 00H table. So to partner with this, we need to add that as well to make this work with the new guideline. Because otherwise, we're going to be forced to code other device, yes. and that would make it look like an applicator rather than the seed product. Is that where you were going, Linda? Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Under current okay. coding, um, if there were, um, if the tables do not currently include the device value radio element by itself, we would uh, report why of the device. So to take your comment into consideration, we'll please encourage you to put that in right into our mailbox so we can consider it. I will, because without that, we're going to have still messy looking data for yeah. this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other coding questions? Okay, thank you. All right. Um, okay, so again, I encourage you to submit your comments to the mailbox and um, we can move on to our next topic. Um, our next topic for this morning is intravascular ultrasound assisted thrombolysis. Um, for those following along in the handouts, we're on page 25. Okay, the issue here is currently there are no ICD-10 PCS codes or code combination available that fully describes uh, intravascular ultrasound assisted thrombolysis with tissue plasminogen activator or TPA. Uh, the requester is not submitting a new tech application at this time. So I would like to welcome Dr. Nicholas Mouad, vascular and endovascular surgeon as consultant for biocompatibles Incorporated, a BTG international group company, to the podium for the clinical presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you very much for the privilege of the podium. Uh, my name is Nick Muad. I'm the Chief of Vascular Surgery at McLaren, the Vice Chair of Surgery, and also the Co-Director of the Pulmonary Embolism Response Team. And today we're going to be talking about thrombolytics. So ultrasound-assisted thrombolysis is really an established treatment modality for venous thromboembolism and peripheral arterial occlusion. Um, it uses a unique catheter that is uh, placed adjacent to the thrombus within the vascular bed, allowing localized treatment of thrombolytics uh, that allows the breakup of clot or thrombus. Currently, the American Hospital Association Coding Clinic specified a two-code solution uh, from tables 6A7 and 3E0. And um, this was a time when there was a transition from ICD-9 to ICD-10 where coding revisions were not possible. And currently, we respectfully request CMS establish a new ICD-10 code to describe intravascular ultrasound-assisted thrombolysis. Ultra, uh, ultrasound assisted thrombolysis is used for, uh, for dealing with vascular thromboses or vascular clots. There's a, two large components, one within the venous system called VTE, which encompasses DVT or deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary emboli, and the other is peripheral arterial occlusion. So DVTs is usually clots in the lower extremities or in the pelvic veins. PEs are um, clots usually in the arteries actually of the lung, even though the pulmonary arteries carry deoxygen, deoxygenated blood uh, from the heart to the lungs, allowing them to be oxygenated. And peripheral arterial occlusion clearly is when vascular flow to the lower extremities uh, is compromised, which could lead to ischemia or lack of blood flow, which could ultimately end up in rest pain, ulceration, gangrene, amputation, sepsis, and death. So dealing with these things acutely is very, very important, and having appropriate modalities to deal with them is critical. Now, while all of these conditions have the same coding issues described, on the previous slide, uh, VTE is more common. We see it much more commonly, and this would apply more commonly to that. So thrombi or clots, and the treatment of lower extremity clots or arterial clots is very, very important. If you have a clot, the way to deal with it is to use a blood thinner. That's what we call anticoagulants. They're generally used for all VTE cases, <clears throat> but they do not 
remove an existing clot. If they do, that's great, and we're happy about it. But the goal of anticoagulants is to avoid propagation of clot, to allow it not to get worse. Clots that are already present are usually treated with thrombolytics. And uh, they're used to, like I said, DVTs or massive or submassive PEs, which are is a different criteria of PE disease. They bind to fibrin and activate a chemical process which leads to fibrinolysis, which ultimately breaks up the clot. With regards to the arterial system, clearly if you don't have good blood flow, the longer you wait, the more tissue dies. We, we, we joke about that and say, uh, say time is tissue. So the longer it takes for you to deal with a clot, particularly in the arterial system, the higher chance you have of having something, some larger complication. To rely on anticoagulants is just not sufficient. It's inadequate. It helps to avoid propagation of the clot, but it does not necessarily remove the clot that is present. And so we like to be more aggressive either with thrombolytics, which are much more aggressive, or manually going in there and surgically extracting the clot. Now, if you have a clot, you want the clot to break up, you give them a lot of strong clot-busting medicine, also known as a thrombolytic. The more thrombolytic you give, you've got to worry about them bleeding. So it's a fine balance between are you being efficacious in what you want to do versus patient safety. So minimizing the dose of thrombolytics is key. You want to be able to achieve that clot breakdown with as little a dose as possible in order not to avoid a bleeding diathesis. There are a variety of options. Catheter-directed thrombolysis or CDT can minimize the dose of thrombolytics. In the past, we used to just inject high-dose thrombolytic in an IV and that works systemically. Those doses were around 100 milligrams from back in the PITHO trial with regards to PEs. Nowadays, we like to be a little more localized and focus our treatment right at the level of the pathology or level of the problem. So we have catheter-directed thrombolysis where we place a catheter at the level of the thrombus and then give the medication. Conventionally, the catheter is just placed there and thrombolytics, the medication, are just infused through that catheter. We become more specialized, we can have a pharmacomechanical option where we place a catheter at the level of the disease, at the clot, and then you either have a rheolytic mechanism, saline jet mechanism, or you can occlude the vessel between two segments and have an oscillating type of device to help break up that clot. Furthermore, nowadays with ultrasound, you can use a high frequency, low intensity ultrasonic wave to help loosen the fibrin uh, in the thrombus which this allows a pressure gradient, allows you to drive more lytic to the area of clot and to help break up that clot. So the echo system is that device. It's a specialized, actually a highly specialized catheter that is placed at the level of pathology adjacent to the clot. And um, this ultrasonic core emits these pulses, acoustic pulses, while the catheter releases the lytic agent. So the medication of the TPA is infused while the ultrasonic acoustic pulse helps to push that deeper and deeper into the clot, allowing for faster fibrinolysis and thrombolysis of the clot. This acoustic pulse helps to unwind uh, these uh, fibrin um, strands and expose the fibrin receptors. And at that point, the clot can integrate into the, I mean, sorry, the lytics can integrate into the clot and help break that up faster. And the interventionist uh, or the surgeon manages this procedure through a control unit which generates and controls the, uh, ra uh, the radio frequency ultrasonic energy. So, patient comes in, they have a massive clot in the lung or in the leg. Uh, you want to confirm that they, in fact, is a clot. This is done by a standard or conventional technique, uh, whether it's CTA or ultrasound, and the patient's placed on anticoagulants to help avoid the clot from propagating. At this point, they contact the interventionalist. Uh, the patient is taken to the angiography suite or the hybrid lab, and then uh, a catheter is basically inserted at the level of the clot through the heart if it's in the lungs or in the lower extremity as necessary. And this is done with continuous hemodynamic monitoring and EC EKG monitoring. And at that point, the lytic is infused uh, through this intravascular delivery uh, of the TPA while the ultrasonic wave is simultaneously um, enhancing these acoustic pulses. The patient is then transferred to the intensive care unit or some other intermediate care unit for completion of treatment. And the treatment is, taken, is performed over several uh, hours, at which point the catheter is removed. Initially, we used to do this for 24 hours. Newer studies have come out, such as the Optolyse, where you can even do these in two, four, and six hour increments, thereby minimizing your dose of thrombolytics with excellent efficacy. So there's a lot of data to support this. Um, 
a kind of, when you put the catheter in there, you, you administer the TPA, and then this ultrasonic energy kind of just shakes around and causes this acoustic pulse to help break up or fragment the clot. So the time to clot dissolution is faster. You remove the initial burden of clot faster if you deal with it sooner. And in my opinion, anecdotally, it enhances the improvement of the patient. You see it much quicker when you, when you use ultrasonic uh, energy. It helps to improve the clearance of clot as compared to conventional uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis because, again, this high-frequency um, uh, ultrasonic energy helps to promote and advance the clot via pressure gradient deep, uh, the lytics, excuse me, deep into the clot to allow for better fragmentation of this clot. And most importantly, really, is that it lowers your risk of bleeding. You're giving doses that are, you know, almost a fourth or a third uh, of what you would give if you were to administer this systemically. So uh, in this last bullet here, you see it requires a much smaller dose of thrombolytics, which minimizes the risk of bleeding, which can be concerning. So currently, from a coding perspective, as, like I said, the American Hospital Association's coding clinic provided guidance giving really two codes, or it was a combination of two codes. One from table 6A7, um, extracorporeal systemic therapies, physiologic systems, ultrasound therapy, and one from table 3E0, administration, physiologic systems, anatomic regions, introduction, as noted there. And this was, again, issued during the transition from ICD-9 to ICD-10, when coding revisions were temporarily suspended. Well, the limitations of the current coding is that table 6A7 really mischaracterizes the action of the ultrasound in the intravascular application. The codes describe extracorporeal systemic Intravascular ultrasound-assisted therapy or thrombolysis is neither extracorporeal nor systemic. And so coders may not recognize the use of these codes from this table as appropriate. Secondarily, ultrasound-assisted thrombolysis involves more than just administration or introduction. Really, it's an infusion. It's a treatment modality. It's an intervention. So reliance on 3E0 appears inadequate to describe the procedure in its entirety. Furthermore, needing more than one code risks incomplete coding. So we respectfully recommend that CMS establish a unique ICD-10 code that has sufficient granularity to describe intravascular ultrasound-assisted thrombolysis for the treatment of uh, DBTPE and PAO. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, again, do we have any cl clinical questions um, in the audience or on the phone? Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, June Bronner, Intelligent Medical Objects, and I guess this is. Uh, somewhat of a clinical and also somewhat of a coding one in looking at ahead at the tables. But um, there's an option for uh, the external approach. And so I'm curious from a clinical perspective, um, using this, the catheter and the procedure that was tr described, um, is external a, um, approach just curious as to that portion because it sounded like clinically it was all done um, percutaneous with inside or and endoscopic inside the vessels. So I was just curious from the clinical perspective um, um, how the procedure. Well, for our, when I, I'll go over option two in a second, our uh, option would be the percutaneous approach, uh, not the external approach that appears in the table. So that will stay and then we would add op, um, We'll be creating a new table, so I'll go over that in one second. Oh, okay. Second. I'm sorry. That's why I wasn't quite sure, but I was wanting to no, that's for fine. that one, little piece. Just so, thank one you. second. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so now I'll go over the clinical, I mean, I'm sorry, the coding options. Uh, currently, as indicated, facilities report the use of intravascular ultrasound assisted thrombolysis using two codes. Uh, it will be code 6A750Z7, ultrasound therapy of other vessels single, and 3E06317 or 3E05317. And this is consistent with published AHA code and advice. Um, our option one would be do not create 
a new ICD-10 PCS code for intravascular ultrasound-assisted thrombolysis. Continue coding as listed in current coding. Okay, option two, add the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary artery, and pulmonary vein body part values to table 02F, fragmentation of heart and great vessels, to identify intravascular ultrasound-assisted thrombolysis of pulmonary embolism. In addition, create new ICD-10 PCS tables 03F and 05F, fragmentation of upper arteries and fragmentation of upper veins, and tables 04F and 06F, fra fragmentation of lower arteries and fragmentation of lower veins, applied to the upper and lower body, uh, lower extremity body part values, and the percutaneous approach to identify intravascular ultrasound-assisted thrombolysis of upper and lower extremity vessels. Facilities may choose to continue to report the administration of the thrombolytic agent separately using the appropriate code as listed above in current coding. Facilities may also choose to report the imaging guidance done to assist in the performance of the procedure with a code from section B with the root type of ultrasound. Okay, option three is add the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary artery, and pulmonary vein body part values to table 02F, fragmentation of heart and great vessels to identify uh, the intravascular ultrasound-assisted thrombolysis, and also create new ICD-10 PCS tables 03F, 05F, uh, 04F, F and 06F for fragmentation of upper arteries, upper veins, lower arteries, and lower veins. Apply to upper and lower extremity body part values with a percutaneous approach. Okay, in addition, we would create a new qualifier value zero ultrasonic for these five tables. Facilities may choose to report the administration of the thrombolytic agent separately using the appropriate code. Okay, right now CMS is seeking input from the audience. So do I, I open up for any coding questions on the line or on the floor? Uh, Sue Bowman from the American Health Information Management Association. And uh, I actually prefer option three uh, mm -hmm. because I like the idea of the ultrasonic qualifier so you, it's more specific exactly in describing the procedure. Um, I would also suggest you might want to consider where, whether a separate row is needed because otherwise things like external apply to you know, all of these body parts as well, which may not be appropriate. And I don't know if you can do ultrasonic fragmentation of the pericardium, but that would be there too if you have it in the same row. So although Rhonda's back there reminding me, I'm not always a big new row advocate, but... <laughs> I'm thinking in this case it might make sense if the, uh, con for consistency to show that the row is supposed to only contain valid options. Okay, thank you. Lynn King, King Consulting, I agree with Sue. I much prefer option three mm -hmm. because I just don't think without the qualifier of ultrasonic that we're still going to get the best description of the procedure. I also think that that 02F table for heart and great vessels, the row that's currently there probably should stay. Just pericardium for fragmentation with those other approaches and make a new row. I'm not sure if we want to add those particular body parts in that existing row, but I'm with Sue. I think a separate row in 02F would be really quite helpful, helpful, or we're going to create codes that are not clinically valid mm -hmm. because you can't do this except through a catheter. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other coding questions? Okay, again, so we encourage you to submit all of your comments to our ICD-10 mailbox uh, for consideration. And thank you very much. And I will now welcome Paula Dupe back to the podium. Good morning again. I would like to direct your attention to page 30 of the agenda and handout packet. 
The topic is administration of nerinotide. There is currently no unique ICD-10 PCS code to describe the administration of nerinotide. The requester is considering a new tech application for fiscal year 2020. At this time, I would like to welcome to the podium Dr. Jeffrey Savers, a neurologist at UCLA. And there's the team back there. <laughs> Good morning. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you and good morning everyone. I am a stroke neurologist and director of the Comprehensive and Stroke and Vascular Neurology Program at UCLA, appearing today at the invitation of NoNo to talk about this uh, proposed new code. In the brief time this morning, I will go over the general statistics about the burden of stroke, the flow of current acute stroke care, introduce the topic of norinotide as a new agent and the rationale for a new code, talk about the ongoing clinical study of NA1 and its regulatory timeline, and then conclude by summarizing the impact of norinotide and the rationale for the new code. Stroke is the leading cause of serious long-term disability in the United States and the fifth leading cause of death in the U.S. And it reduces mobility in more than half of survivors over age 65. Three quarters of all strokes occur in individuals over age 65. And there are more than uh, nearly 800,000 individuals in the U.S. who suffer a stroke each year, among whom 18% uh, have fatal outcome and 82% survive with various degrees of physical, emotional, and cognitive disability. The flow path for acute stroke currently in the U.S. is shown here. Patients have acute symptoms and arrive at the emergency department and undergo diagnostic imaging that separates out the 85% of patients who have an ischemic stroke, a blockage in a blood vessel, from the 15% of patients who have a hemorrhagic stroke bleeding into the brain or around the brain. And for the more common ischemic stroke, the immediate uh, treatment decision pathway is then entered uh, with drugs or devices that can reopen the blocked arteries and restore blood flow, either thrombolytic drugs, TPA, that we heard about earlier today, or endovascular thrombectomy devices to pull the clots out of the blocked artery. Patients then get admitted to the intensive care unit or stroke unit, undergo additional diagnostic testing, uh, and start a secondary prevention in the acute hospitalization and then are discharged home. The agent we are discussing today does not fit into this pathway. Uh, it uh, has a unique place. It's nerinotide, an emergency drug that is aimed at reducing functional disability in patients with acute ischemic stroke. It is a postsynaptic density inhibitor uh, of the uh, PSD95 uh, 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 molecule. It is to be administered as soon as possible following symptom onset in ischemic stroke as a single intravenous dose, 2.6 milligrams per kilogram, prior to the start of endovascular thrombectomy. It does target the PSD95 uh, molecule, which is a synaptic scaffolding protein that links the NMDA glutamate receptor to neurotoxic brain toxic signaling pathways, which lead to cell death from ischemic insult. So this is not a drug like TPA that dissolves clots and reopens blood flow. This is a drug that protects neurons while they're experiencing reduced blood flow. It limits the molecular elaboration of injury in the neurons. It aims, therefore, to extend the window of eligibility for stroke patients to receive endovascular thrombectomy so that there's more brain saved when the uh, blood flow is restored and less ischemic damage. Currently, there are no existing ICD-10 PCS codes that describe the administration of norinotide or of PSD-95 antagonists. 
Currently, there is a large international phase three trial, the ESCAPE NA1 trial. That is the pivotal trial of this drug. Uh, it is a randomized placebo co uh, controlled trial. That's enrolled 1,120 participants using the acute dose that I've discussed, uh, started within 12 hours of last known well. And the primary outcome is the patients who are functionally independent three months after their stroke. Uh, the trial started in 2017. The last patient has been enrolled, and the last study visit will occur in November of 2019. So uh, the results of this trial are shortly to be known. Looking at the uh, development pathway for norinotide, uh, phase two trial was completed in 2011, which showed strong signals of potential benefit by reducing the number of strokes occurring on brain imaging in a uh, uh, interventional setting. Uh, it was then granted orphan drug designation and now fast track designation by FDA. And very shortly in November of 2019, the phase three trial will be completed. And as a result, it's expected that FDA approval with uh, positive trial results will occur in Q1 of 2021. So, norinotide is an emergency drug aimed at reducing functional disability in patients with acute ischemic stroke undergoing thrombectomy. There are no existing ICD-10 PCS codes that describe the administration of norinotide. They only describe thrombolytic agents. Uh, and that uh, drug class and also the thrombectomy device class are not applicable codes for PSD-95 antagonists. A unique ICD-10 PCS code for norinotide would assure distinct tracking of drug utilization and of corresponding patient outcomes to better inform treatment and policy making for this medical emergency. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be glad to take any questions. I have a really easy question. Can you roll the slide back? Sure. Thank you. Um. I wanted to ask a kind of a, a broad question that um, gets at what um, you might have hinted at here. You, it was uh, noted it's a member of a new class of neuroprotectant drugs, terms PSD-95 inhibitors or antagonists, I suppose. Um, can you tell us anything about other members of that class that either may be in development or anticipated to be um, are there any of those being worked on? If so, how many? And um, uh, how might those um, also become important in the future? Well, I, I do know that uh, NoNo itself does have an, uh, one other candidate agent that also is a PSD-95 antagonist that's at an earlier stage of development and is probably one to two years. Uh, at least further back before um, uh, and uh, coming into uh, pivotal trial testing. Um, I, I'm not aware of any other agents that are in, in advanced development. Okay. Are, um, uh, are there any other either neuroprotectant drugs of some type that would have similar effects or, or none that you're aware of? Well, uh, there are in the Neuroprotective agents very broadly defined as any drug that does not act at the vessel level, but acts at the neuronal level to uh, prevent ischemic injury, even though it may not be through the NMDA signaling pathways. Uh, there are several such drugs uh, currently being tested in, uh, largely in phase two trials. Um, they include uh, oxygen diffusion enhancing agents and, um, and other uh, very different types of drugs. Um, is there likely to be a need to identify a category of neuroprotectant drugs uh, beyond what's being proposed right now? Uh, and um, how might that fit into how we're, we move forward to uh, identify things like this in future? 
there is a potential need to identify neuroprotective drugs more broadly. Uh, neuroprotective drugs in the past have had a disappointing development program with uh, many being tested and uh, not having made it into clinical practice, but uh, we think uh, norinotide has the uh, greatest evidence uh, uh, to support a benefit so far and that we've learned to do these trials better. So for other agents eventually also, they may eventually come into practice. Um, and I, I think uh, it's, it, it, uh, and it, it may be desirable to have both a, a way to track neuroprotective agents broadly, but also important to be able to track each type of agent specifically uh, within that class. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I didn't identify myself earlier, uh, Dr. David Berglund, CDC, and I'll pass it over to someone else. Lynn King, King Consulting. So the correct name for this class of drugs is neuroprotectant drugs because if I understood you right, we could have something other than a PSD95 inhibitor that would also be a neuroprotectant. It acts at the neural level rather than the vessel level. Is this right? Well, there are, are different ways to define the superordinate class of drugs. You could be defined as just all PSD95 inhibitors. That would be a narrow superordinate class. It could be defined as all NMDA receptor interacting molecules. That would be slightly broader. And then the broadest would be all neuroprotective drugs. Uh, that would be a, a, a much, much larger class. And, um, uh, that would be the most encompassing class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Savers. Any other clinical questions? If not, we'll move on to the current coding. Current coding facilities can report the intravenous administration of norinotide with one of the following ICD-10 PCS codes, 3E033GC, introduction of other therapeutic substance into peripheral vein, percutaneous approach, 3E043GC, introduction of other therapeutic substance into central vein, percutaneous approach. Option one, do not create new ICD-10 PCS code for the administration of norinotide. Continue using current codes as listed. Option two, create new qualifier value T norinotide in table 3E0 of section three administration apply to the fourth character values peripheral vein and central vein and the sixth character value other therapeutic substance to identify intravenous infusion of norinotide. Option three, create new codes in the section X, new technology to identify intravenous infusion of norinotide. CMS recommendation is option three, create new code in section X, new technology to identify intravenous infusion of norinotide. Interim coding advice, continue to code as above under current coding. And any coding questions or comments? I'm Linda Holtzman, Clarity Coding. I just wanted to comment that um, I, I want to thank Dr. Berglund for raising his point. It was uh, particularly uh, um, incisive, I mm -hmm. thought. Um, it seems to me, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I like it in section X mm -hmm. for right now okay. uh, until the trials mm -hmm. are completed. And then at some point, um, hopefully after FDA approval and mm -hmm. all that, perhaps it could be moved to uh, 3E0 where we could get a new uh, value for substance okay. for neuroprotective. Okay. But I think right now, section X is a good place for it to be. And then I, I very much like the notion of creating a, 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 a new substance value for the entire class okay. of drugs. Thanks. Thank you, Linda, for your comment. And please submit that comment to our mailbox as well. Lynn Keen, I agree with Linda. I think it's premature to put it in 3E0 table, but I would like it there. And I would prefer to have it as a substance value rather than a qualifier value when the time does come. Okay, thank you for your comment. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, and at this time, I would like to welcome Noel Manlove to the podium.
So good morning, everyone. Our next topic is going to be the administration of elodocagene exuparvovec. It's a mouthful to say. Um, the issue is currently there is not a unique ICD-10 PCS code to describe the administration of this drug for the treatment of AADC deficiency, which is a rare inherited neurometabolic metabolic disease with life-threatening limitation. Life, I'm sorry, I'm all messed up today. Um, with life-limiting consequences. Um, there is uh, going to be a new technology application submitted for fiscal year 2021. Currently, it is not FDA approved, but an application for that will be submitted in quarter four of this year um, with an anticipated fast-track approval by July 2020. So this topic is on page 32 of the agenda and handouts packet, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Brian Fister to um, present the slides. Well, good morning. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here. I just want to also say thank you to the Nord and Every Life Foundation for their efforts. Um, again, I'm, I'm happy to be here, and I guarantee you in 10 minutes, I'll make brain surgery easy, easy so hopefully uh, this will go smoothly. But um, the most difficult part of the, the process is the name, so we'll kind of uh, work through that. But um, the idea of AADC deficiency. So people may ask what it is. AAD, AADC deficiency is a rare genetic disorder. Um, in which kids don't have a functioning DDC gene. There's a mutation with the DDC gene which prohibits them from being able to produce the enzyme to metabolize L-dope into dopamine. So this lack of a uh, neurotransmitter, lack of dopamine, creates a situation where these kids don't grow, they don't develop, they don't thrive. Um, a lot of them um, don't have motor control. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things that, that we look at and one of the things that we understand is, is without the neurotransmitters being functional in these kids, without these kids being able to develop and metabolize the building blocks for dopamine, um, the kids end up with a, a cluster of clinical symptoms. So those, those symptoms tend to be um, hypotonia, movement disorders, severe neurological dysfunction. Ultimately, if you look at these kids and you think about what this looks like from a clinical presentation, these children just basically are not able to interact with the world around them. They're not able to function. They're not able to uh, really grow and to develop as you would expect with normal kids. And their trajectory, if you think about this, this is consistent. From birth to death, these kids don't get better. These kids don't improve. So when you ask how many kids are affected with this, what's the prevalence rate? We've got some other diseases up there for reference so you can see you know, exactly how rare this, this condition is. So if you look at the literature and you look at um, different studies, whether it's newborn screening or if you look at chart reviews, uh, we put that estimate somewhere between one in 32,000 and one in 90,000. So again, this kind of gives you an idea. SMA, you know, just below it, gives you a reference point. Uh, most people are familiar with SMA. So how does this work? So what's the function behind this? As I mentioned before, if we're lacking an enzyme, if we have a, a genetic variant that, that doesn't allow us to produce an enzyme to metabolize L-dopa into dopamine, this is the root cause of what's happening with these children. So this is the AADC deficient child. What we've identified is in the brain, and again, here's the brain surgery part that I'll make super simple. What we've identified is, is within the brain, in the putamen in particular, if we can deliver a gene, the, the you know, correct the gene issue within the brain via the putamen, um, we give these children an opportunity to grow and to develop. So we chose the putamen for a couple different reasons, the biggest one being it's a non-dividing cell area. That it's a, the affected cells remain intact, so the idea is um, kind of one and done process. And it's also, I think the bigger piece is, I can locate it. It's easy to find. It's, I'm able to deliver uh, exactly what I expect to in the location I expect to. So there's some ease in brain surgery. So when you look at it, currently, um, the treatment options, they, they have some, but there's nothing that's approved by the FDA for AADC deficiency. So when you look at first-line treatments are, are obviously going to be um, dopamine receptor agonists as well as an MAOIs. 
The problem with that, the problem with all the therapies that are currently available in the armament uh, with physicians is they don't really work. So 99% of these kids will not respond. 99% will not do better uh, with the current therapies. There's also non-pharmacologic interventions, so things such as physical therapy, occupational, spare, uh, occupational therapy, and speech therapy don't do any good either. So basically, if we can identify these children, match them up with the appropriate therapy, match them up with the appropriate intervention, we can actually change the trajectory of development for these kids. So that's why it's so important for us to kind of identify, you know, really what's the code here that we can unlock these kids from their bodies. They're stuck inside, their brains are normal, but don't develop properly. So this one, I think, is also probably one of the most important slides, because this is the how. So when we look at this and we understand that, that via gene therapy, we take a viral vector and it delivers a payload. In this case, it delivers our therapy into the CNS, as I mentioned before, in the putamen. Um, what this does is it replaces that particular uh, DDC gene variant with a functional DDC gene, which allows for the production of an enzyme to metabolize L-dopa into dopamine. So the way that this is achieved is basically it's um, injected directly into the putamen, as I mentioned before, in a process that takes about seven to eight hours. Um, the nice thing about this, and I think the advantage that we have with our therapy is it's microdosing. So if you look at the total delivery of volume, it's 320 microliters. That's, based upon, or that's broken out over four different um, injections of 80 microliters on each side, with the total dose being 1.8 times 10 to the 11th uh, viral genomes. So when you look at this, again, you have relatively small amounts of, of drug being delivered, um, and the benefits are, are you know, innumerable. So when you look at it too, the hospital length, or the patient's stay in the hospital post um, brain surgery, essentially, in this case, is three to four days. So you're going to watch, you're going to observe the patient, you're going to look for anything. Uh, bleeding risks, obviously, would, would be the thing that you would want to focus on. So this is you know, a new technology, because currently there is no FDA-approved uh, therapies for AADC deficiency. Um, no existing products have a similar mechanism of action. So this is kind of uncharted territories in a lot of ways. And what we want to do is, based upon what we've done in clinical trials, I want to show you some of the clinical trial data, because I think it's important to understand the impact that we have on these kids. So we go back through and we look at the, uh, the studies that were done. There were two, 1601 and 010, which will be in the registration process, open label, with comparison to 82 natural history patients. So when you look at the demographics, you know, the average age, I think, before was 3.5, the age of diagnosis, even though it can be as early as three months old. So what we look looked at is we had 21 months to eight and a half year old uh, children that were included in this trial. All had confirmed CSF um, diagnosis of AADC deficiency, and then we followed those patients for a period of time. What this looks like, and I think this is probably the most important piece within the clinical trial, is if you had a normal patient with AADC, their trajectory would be like this. They would flatline. They wouldn't show increases. All the patients in this clinical trial showed increases, and all of them showed uh, benefit long term. So when you look at this individually, when you look at each of the patients and, and what their particular score was, and this was based upon the Peabody um, motor development scale, this is what their raw scores were. So 10, to, just to give you a point of reference, 10 on the Peabody is clinically meaningful. So all of these kids had a clinically meaningful benefit. And what was interesting, too, is, is had long-term benefit, too. So it wasn't just kind of a short little blip. These kids continued to develop. So whether it was one year, um, it, less than one year, one year, or over two years, you saw this benefit for these kids. So again, we're, we're very encouraged because going back to the other therapies, they're just not getting better in other therapies. The other thing that improved as well beyond motor symptoms was also cognition and language. So again, the ability to interact with the environment, the ability to function um, as a normal child would, it is definitely beginning to, to show improvement for these kids. So when you look at this, and um, you know, even a significant proportion of patients, so as we follow these patients out longer and get more and more data, a significant portion of these patients showed milestone development. As mentioned before, without the therapy, they would have no development whatsoever. They would basically be the same child that they were um, at birth. So when we look at this and say, how do we know that our therapy is actually working? How do we know the, the benefit is there? I don't know if you can see in this uh, picture very well. But we did, um, in the axial and coronal, we did um, basically radio tag DOPA to understand where that's being picked up. So what you can see is these dark areas here, 
and here and here are all post-therapy where you see the, the uh, radio tag dopa showing up. So we're showing that benefit because before without the therapy, you wouldn't have seen that benefit there. So we're confident that what we're intending to do, we're doing it and uh, having profound effect with these children. So then on the flip side, we have to make sure we understand what the side effects are and we have to then understand you know, what we see. So basically, um, Dyskinesia is not a surprise to us because these kids had dystonia to begin with. So as we replace that dopamine, we would expect to see dyskinesias. All the side effects that we saw, all the adverse events were, um, none of them were, you know, basically the SAEs, none of them were attributable to the drug itself. And uh, most of these went away as the uh, brain kind of adjusted. So in a nutshell, safety and efficacy, there's profound safety in this drug. Efficacy, as I showed you before, without the therapy, these children aren't going to improve. The children aren't going to thrive and develop. But what we've done is we've been able to, to show, you know, by changing that DDC gene, that we're able to uh, give them a positive outcome. So, um, and just in summary, if we get the ICD-10 code, if there is a, a way to identify and accurately code these patients, um, we feel it would be you know, a huge improvement and a huge benefit for these kids. So thank you, and that was brain surgery in 10 minutes or less, so I appreciate the time. Are there any qu uh, clinical questions on the floor? Thank you. I'm Linda Holtzman from Clarity Coding. I'm actually interested in the diagnosis itself. Yep. Um, I heard you, uh, I think I heard you mention Nord is, was Nord. involved in, the, yeah. in this um, uh, proposal. No, National Organization for Rare Diseases, is that it? I believe so, yeah. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about the diagnosis. Yep. Uh, I confess I'd never heard of it before, but I'm like wondering, <laughs> How, which I guess is good, right? Sure. I'm wondering how that would be coded. Um, I see that, that the, doc, uh, the proposal mentions um, uh, aromatic. Can yeah, you speak so, to that? Because so, there's, we, have, we have two code categories. One is for deficiencies in um, aromatic uh, amino acid transport, and the other is uh, for diagnosis code categories. The other is for uh, uh, other disorders of amino acid uh, right. me metabolism. So I'm wondering which, which way I would go. So I think the other one, I think the, the one you mentioned, um, the metabolism piece is going to tie more into like Parkinson's type of things. So this is going to be separated out of that to kind of create less confusion. Um, because as you saw in the, the current drugs that are used, a lot of those are like dopamine um, mm -hmm. agonists, what you would use w within a uh, particular Parkinson's patient. Um, I'm not really talking about the, the, um, the drugs. I'm talking about the, the diagnosis. Right. But uh, so the word aromatic that, that was... Uh, it, that's in the, in the proposal. That's that's not really. Uh, and I'm Noel. I'm sorry. I'm like hijacking the procedure portion here for a diagnosis question. Yeah. But um, the, the 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 aromatic the the word aromatic is not is not. Uh, so so it is. So ADC is is aromatic amino acid decarboxylase. Right. So the deficiency is that you lack that enzyme completely to oh. allow for the production of. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Berglund has pointed out to me that they're they're talking about the diagnosis code later. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> twice today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. You, David Berglund, CDC. Yeah. Um, we will be talking about the diagnosis code for this that will be proposed tomorrow, so we may want to go into detail about that then. Um, I don't know if we want to spend too much time on it right now then. Yep. Um, but thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll be back for that one tomorrow as well. So yes, yeah, you'll, you'll hear definitely... from again. <laughs> yeah, no and problem. I can introduce thank him you. again then, but we'll, we'll talk about yeah. that more later. Uh, thank okay. you, Dr. Freister. I, thank you. I won't ask or talk. Appreciate it. All right, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Pfister. Um, currently, there is no unique um, ICD-10 PCS code to describe the percutaneous injection of the ladocagene, exuparvovec, into the brain. Facilities can report the administration of this drug with the following ICD-10 PCS code. Um, 3E0Q3GC, introduction of other therapeutic substance into the cranial cavity and brain, percutaneous approach. Our coding options, the first one is, as always, um, to not create a new code for this. Option two, to create a qualifier, value R, elodocadine, exuparvovec, 
into Table 3E0 of Section 3, Administration, applied to the body system value Q, cranial cavity and brain, the percutaneous approach, and the substance value G, other therapeutic substance, to identify the injection of the drug into the brain. Option three would be to create a new code in Section X, new technology, to identify the percutaneous injection of the drug into the brain. CMS recommends option three, to create a new code in Section X of the new technology, to identify the injection of elodocogene, exuparvec, into the brain. And the interim coding advice is to continue co to code as above under the code and current, uh, current coding section. So with that said, are there any questions on the floor relating to the coding options as presented? Okay. Moderator, could you open up the phone lines to see if there are any questions on the line? Sure thing. One moment, please. Are there any questions on the line? All lines have been unmuted. Thank you. Are there any questions on the line? Okay, with hearing nothing, we'll um, proceed to the next topic. Uh, Michelle Joshua will be presenting that to us. Good morning. The next topic is administration of Zolreso. The issue is, currently, there is no unique ICD-10 PCS code to describe the administration of Zolreso. Here to provide the clinical presentation is Mr. Jeremy Lutz, Senior Director of Commercial Operations and Analytics at SAGE. Thank you. <laughs> Come on up. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to present today. Uh, my name is uh, Jeremy Lutz. I'm a salaried employee of Sage Therapeutics. Uh, I serve as the Senior Director of Commercial Operations and Analytics. Uh, today I'm here to discuss the need for a unique ICD-10 PCS code to describe the administration of Zolreso, brexanolone, uh, which is the first and only FDA-approved pharmacological therapy specifically indicated to treat postpartum depression in adults. So in order to understand Zoreso and the operational need for the establishment of a unique ICD-10 PCS code, uh, we must acknowledge the current treatment landscape, the burden of PPD, and the limitations of the current care delivery model. Postpartum depression can affect any new mother and is the most common complication of pregnancy and childbirth in the United States. The CDC estimates the incidence of PPD varies by state from 8 to 20 percent, uh, with about one in nine mothers uh, potentially developing postpartum depression. Uh, expert opinion varies as to the timing and sym of symptom onset. Um, however, many mothers do not present uh, with symptoms until the weeks following delivery and discharge, and therefore may not have immediate access to the same level of care or the same providers from their original delivery stay. Uh, and this, uh, from a payer perspective, this most often represents a separate treatment encounter than the labor and delivery stay. Uh, PPD can have a significant negative impact on maternal quality of life and may have a long-term negative impact on the development of the child's relationships with the partner uh, and levels of the partner's own stress and depression affecting the well-being of the whole family unit. Uh, PPD carries an increased risk of suicide, and suicide is the leading cause of maternal death following childbirth through one year postpartum. Before the approval of Zoreso, there were no medications approved specifically to treat postpartum depression. Uh, patients with PPD are commonly prescribed a variety of medi medications, several of those classes uh, represented here on the right-hand side. Typically, they're used for depression or other mood disorders, um, as well as uh, non-drug treatments such as uh, psychotherapy. 
Um, however, limitations exist in the little data available that would uh, support the use of traditional, largely antidepressant-based pharmacotherapies uh, in PPD, and these therapies typically reflect a delayed efficacy response, uh, generally taking four to six weeks to demonstrate meaningful clinical benefit, if at all. Uh, through market research conducted by Sage Therapeutics, patients have identified potential challenges with those treatment options, including um, long wait times for an appointment and difficulty scheduling a follow-up appointment with the provider, uh, especially mental health providers, uh, insurance coverage uh, challenges, delays or interruption in treatment uh, based on a patient's response or experience to the drug, um, changes in the medication or doses, uh, which may not be effective, and the length of the treatment plan being much longer than anticipated. With the previous information as background, in 2016, Zoresso was awarded with breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA before uh, formal regulatory approval on March uh, 19, 2019, and became commercially available in June 2019 following the completion of scheduling with the Drug Enforcement Agency. As previously mentioned, Zoresso is the first FDA-approved pharmacological therapy specifically indicated for the treatment of PPD in adults. Zoresso contains brexanolone, a neuroactive steroid, um, and a Schedule IV controlled substance that is chemically identical to endogenous allopregnanolone. Um, Zoresso injection is supplied as a 100 milligram brexanolone in 20 ml, uh, 5 milligram per ml concentration single dose vials. Um, Zoresso is administered as a continuous intravenous infusion over a total of 60 hours requiring titration. And Zoresso is available only through a restricted program under risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. Uh, because excessive sedation and sudden loss of consciousness can result in serious harm. Um, furthermore, Zoresso can be administered in a variety of healthcare settings, including inpatient hospital settings, uh, outpatient hospital settings, uh, and a variety of non-hospital settings of care in the community. Um, Zoresso is not intended to be administered more than one time per occurrence of PPD with a pregnancy. The Zoresso FDA approval was supported by three randomized multicenter placebo controlled trials in patients with moderate to severe postpartum depression. All studies showed a statistically significant reduction in PPD severity in only two and a half days, uh, as measured by the HAMD scale, which was the primary endpoint in all three studies. Uh, Zoresso treated patients experiencing a rapid and significant improvement of depressive symptoms with a durable therapeutic effect maintained through day 30. Importantly, the two phase three studies shown here were performed at 30 clinical research centers and specialized psychiatric units across the United States. The diversity of care settings between hospital and non-hospital settings uh, of care is now being reflected in the data supporting Zoresso REMS uh, certified sites. Zoresso uh, does work differently and this treatment has the unique ability to rapidly address the urgent symptoms of postpartum depression. The administration of Zoresso in any setting of care involves a multidisciplinary stakeholder approach, ensuring the clinical and operational requirements of the REMS and prescribing information are met. Uh, this requires centers to implement certain processes and procedures, including completion of registration process and training of all the providers involved in the infusion and patient stay, monitoring patients during the infusion, including use of a pulse oximeter and wellness checks every two hours, uh, submitting pre and post infusion paperwork uh, for each patient, uh, determine the means of procuring, storing a scheduled product, and preparing the vials for infusion, identification of appropriate infusion pumps and pump programming instructions, intake and scheduling instructions, including consideration for the right room or care setting within the center for PPD patients having unique personal or family needs. So as discussed earlier, Zoresso works differently, and this treatment has the unique ability to rapidly address the urgent symptoms of PPD. Zoresso's introduction has brought enhanced clinical optionality to clinicians and PPD sufferers alike, uh, necessitating new care pathways and delivery system supports. There are currently no ICD-10 PCS codes that uniquely describe Zoresso administration or supervision associated with its administration. A unique ICD-10 PCS code is needed to identify Zoresso in order to facilitate inpatient hospital billing and identify Zoresso cases and claims data. And a unique code will allow for the identification, tracking, and capturing of outcomes data for Zoresso. I'd like to thank uh, this committee uh, and the audience for their time, and uh, we'd be happy to take any questions. Uh,
Lynn Keen, Keen Consulting. Mm -hmm. Please forgive my lack of knowledge, but are these patients basically in a general hospital facility or are these in psychiatric facilities? Um, there are a number of different options available for a patient. So uh, if a patient presents with certain symptoms, which may include um, suicidality, then that patient may be appropriate for a psychiatric unit. Um, but many mothers can still experience moderate or severe postpartum depression without um, that type of supervision. And so uh, the centers that we've seen begin to uh, adopt Zoreso are doing it in a variety of different settings. Some of it in community settings, family emergency clinics, um, general meta wards, uh, postpartum units. Um, so there can be varying levels of acuity or in different places of the center. So you would potentially see this also in a psych facility with in, the right medical yes. observation? Yes, you could. Yes. Okay, thanks. I wanted to know, would this be general hospitals or psych hospitals? And he said yes. With, and I said with the right medical supervision, it could be in a psych hospital. Yes. In, Correct. It could be inpatient, it could be outpatient, OBS, whatever. Yep. Or in the right clinical setting uh, um, in the community. Correct. Okay, yes. thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, yep. Okay. yep. Moderator, will you open the lines for questions? Moderator, are you there? Yes, give me one second. All lines are unmuted. Are there any questions on the line for Mr. Lutz regarding the administration of Zolareso? Okay, hearing no questions, thank you. We'll move on to the current coding. Current coding, currently there is no unique ICD-10 PCS code to describe the administration of Zolreso. Facilities can report the administration of Zolreso with the following ICD-10 PCS codes. 3E033GC or 33, I'm sorry, 3E043GC. Coding options. Option one, do not create new codes for the administration of Zolreso. Continue using the current codes as described. Option two, create a new qualifier value R for Brexanolone in table 3E0 of section three. Administration, apply to the fourth character values, peripheral vein and central vein, and the sixth character. The sixth character value, other therapeutic substance to identify the intravenous administration of Zolreso. Option three would be to create new codes in section X, new technology, to identify the intravenous infusion of Zolreso. CM CMS recommends option three, create new codes in section X as described. Interim coding would include to continue to code as above in the current coding option section. Do we have any questions in the audience regarding the coding options for the administration of Zolreso? Seeing none, moderator, please open the line for questions, current coding questions or coding questions on the line. All lines have been unmuted. Do we have any questions on the line? regarding co coding options for Zolreso. Okay, hearing no questions, um, should there be questions or comments, please do submit them in writing by the aforementioned deadlines which are listed in your agenda packet. Okay, I'll turn the podium over to Maddie to discuss Section X, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. She's looking very regal today. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so we're to the point in our meeting where we're discussing everybody's favorite section, <laughs> section X. And uh, for those of you that were at the March meeting, you may recall that um, on the pages following this that we had a very um, brief overview of the status of section X. But what we intended to address was um, what I'll just briefly go over because a lot of this has already been reflected in the ICD-10 PCS guidelines for fiscal year 2020. So all of you can read at your pleasure, but I'll just highlight a couple things for those that are a little bit newer to this process. And under general information, that is that Section X new technology is a section that was added when ICD-10 PCS was implemented beginning October 1st, 2015. And the section is for the purpose for codes that uniquely identify procedures to capture new technologies that are not currently classified under ICD-10 PCS or procedures that generally would not be reported in the inpatient setting. The section is intended as a separate place for certain procedures utilizing new technologies, such as what we've just heard with the last three presentations, infusions of newly developed drugs, new treatment modalities, or new adjunct procedures. The Section X new technology does not introduce new coding concepts or unusual guidelines for correct coding. Um, over the past year and probably since implementation, we've gotten um, some comments that people are confused, they're not sure how to use it. So we hope that um, since implementation that we've addressed some of those concerns and um, this again is an effort to continue to clarify the purpose of Section X. So um, in the bottom of the page, you can see that it, it gives you a couple of examples and the um, main part is that we generally maintain continuity with other sections in ICD-10 by using the same root operation and the body part values as the closest counterparts in other sections of ICD-10 PCS. And in this paragraph, there are two examples. One um, has been used since the beginning of section S, the septazidime avibactam. And sorry if I mess up that <laughs> drug name. Um, that became effective October 1st, 2015 and it uses the same root operation introduction and the body part values of central vein or peripheral vein in section X as um, other sections of PCS. Um, a different example would be the codes for monitoring of the knee joint uh, for intraoperative knee replacement monitoring procedures. And these use the fourth character body part values of knee joint right and knee joint left. And, um, they do not have counterparts in the section four of measurement and monitoring. And this differing level of specificity was included to satisfy the data collection needs. So that's our main objective, is what is um, the benefit of the data? I'm gonna flip over and under coding instruction, and because uh, we leave the coding education to AHA and HIMA mainly, just going to briefly um, discuss that these Section X codes, they can be reported alone as well as with other ICD-10 PCS codes, um, depending whether or not multiple procedures are performed. These Section X codes do fully represent the specific new technology that is described in the procedure code title, and they do not require an additional code from another section to capture the new technology. And again, there's another example of the ceftazidime. We added this to the guideline. It does not mean that the procedure described by a new technology section X code must be reported alone. So when it comes to coding multiple procedures during inpatient hospital stay, you want to use the new technology section X code no different from any other ICD-10 PCS code. So if additional procedures are performed, then multiple procedures are reported. So the last two examples are um, included to identify for example, the cerebral embolic filtration device that was added in new technology group two would be reported to indicate that new technology of the dual filter cerebral embolic filtration device that was utilized in a TAVR procedure. But you would still report the separate code to indicate that the TAVR was performed. 
So we hope that that provides additional clarification. And um, as usual, Nellie, don't mean to put you on the spot, but <laughs> specific coding questions can be submitted to Coding Clinic. And just along the bottom, um, again, people had mentioned concerns and difficulty finding the Section X code. So we just want to remind folks that there is the ICD-10 PCS index as well as the tables. And you can look under the main term for the drug or under the heading of new technology to find these codes. Um, we're now on page 41. And when applicable, we also um, do our best to add entries to the device key or the substance key to further assist coders in selecting the available codes for this. Um, the codes are displayed just like any other ICD-10 PCS codes as you saw on the tables with the last three presentations. So do we have any comments or questions regarding that information? Is everybody clear? It's helpful? Okay, I see some heads nodding. Okay, so we're going to move on to the Section X update. And this information is um, the same information <laughs> that was uh, presented in March. So just to, again, uh, recap, we started to analyze the Section X code now that it has been three years since the new technology Group 1 codes became effective. Um, some of the things that we're looking at as we review these codes are whether or not the procedure code was related to a new technology out on application. If yes, was the technology approved for NTAP? And then we wanted to look at the frequency or the volume um, in which the procedure code was reported in the data for the um, three years. And then based on review of that data and the clinical aspects of each procedure code, we would discuss um, one of the options below for these codes, which would be to one, leave the code in section X, or two, reassign the code to the med surge section and delete it from section X, or three, delete the section X code. And we had stated that um, because of the limited time that we had at the March meeting that we weren't able to have um, the full discussion and we didn't propose any of those options. We presented the information on the 14 procedure codes that you see listed. And we also provided the table of the frequency for fiscal years 2016, 2017, and 2018. And we indicated whether or not that technology was approved under the NTAP application process. Some of the comments that we got after the March meeting were that um, people wanted to know if we could possibly align the new technology add-on application process with these Section X codes. And unfortunately, we're unable to do so because of the time frame. You heard in the timeline that when we present code proposals at the September meeting, they're um, either finalized or not, and they would show up in the proposed rule. And then at the March meeting, those would end up in the final addenda, which we make available in either late May or early June. So the final rule is not put on display until August, and um, not that we we're really discussing new technology out on application process here. Um, Michelle will be doing the town hall for that process, but um, those have until July 1st to obtain FDA approval. So there's just a misalignment with the time frame, and we're, we're just kind of stuck. So unfortunately, we, we cannot address that. Um, so we, you know, we'll continue to try and find alternate ways. We're open if you have suge alternate suggestions, and we're um, very willing to uh, review those. So at this time, you can see that the trends are going upward with each fiscal year. Um, even though there were only the, um, the one code that was actually approved for new tech, um, the other codes are being reported. So our thoughts at this time are not to recommend deleting these codes. We can continue to monitor and we can bring you updated data at the March meeting. And the other thing is that at the March meeting, we'll be presenting the new technology group two information. 
So you'll have the ability to comment on those um, because of the way the uh, fiscal year is set up and our, our data polls, it will always be the March meeting where we would present the information on the frequency and volume of cases for these um, new technology codes. So do we have any comments, concerns, or questions with that? I see somebody coming. If you happen to think of something after the meeting, you know the email address to send it to. Hi, June Bronner, um, IMO. And I'm just curious, a question from the perspective looking at the data, is there a general um, guideline or theme that you're looking at to say if the code's reported in this percentage bracket or that percentage bracket, we would consider um, the maybe deletion or moving to the different sections? Have those discussions um, occurred? We're reviewing that. We have not established a threshold, if that's what you're asking. Um, I think it, it's really going to depend on the nature of the code and how it's utilized. Yeah, that, that would be great. And I guess that would be one comment and recommendation as that's evolving to, um, um, to bring that forth as well for people to, to comment. A certain see. percentage. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then to track to if um, the codes are moved into different sections and out of the new technology, how to, for lack of a better word, crosswalk or keep that data connection tied together okay. as they move. Such so. as a conversion table? Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, June. Do we have any other comments or questions? Any thoughts? Moderator, can you open the phone lines to see if there's any comments or questions? All lines have been unmuted. Okay, doesn't sound like we have any comments or questions on the phone lines. Um, again, just uh, think, think it over and uh, we're happy to review your comments. And at this time, I would like to uh, present Rhonda Butler from 3M, who will be reviewing our ICD-10 PCS addenda, as well as have a discussion on PCS structure and maintenance. Thanks, Maddie. Do not go away. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's kind of fun to be here in person. It's been a while. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to just spend a couple minutes on the addenda because this is uh, one of the shortest, I think, addenda sections that we've had in recent years. And um, there's just a couple device uh, key entries that are cross-listed in the index, so we'll go over those first. There's maybe one body part key entry and then a couple of table addenda that we'll go over briefly. Um, the first device value uh, that's been requested for the device key, it's also cross-listed in the index here, is the barricade annular closure device. So a request to add that uh, and the instruction to use synthetic substitute. Um, Cook, there was a request from Cook to just um, add more detail and clarify that there are Cook, Zenith, uh, AAA endovascular graphs that are um, just go to intraluminal device because they're not part of the fenestrated and um, branched or fenestrated system. And then, then we're adding a new uh, device key and index entry that specifies down here at the second main where it says Cook Zenith fenestrated AAA, and then it goes to those more uh, specific device values. So that's, you know, you see that listed twice and it looks more complex than it is, but that's the meat of what the, the request was. And then down at the bottom here, letter S um, is the single body part key request to add uh, or actually to change um, the body part key entry for scapholunate ligament instead of going to the hand bursa and ligament body part values, it goes to the wrist. And then um, the letter Z is just 
uh, listing those cooked zenith endovascular grafts under zenith, so it's the same content. Okay, and then on to the next page. Um, here we see those body part key entries listed as addenda in the body part key. You're all very familiar with the fact that these are also cross-listed in the index, so we're just seeing the same, same request in two different formats. Um, scrolling back down to the device key, key addenda, ditto there. <laughs> and then um, that's it. So we're seeing the barricade annular closure device listed again, and again, the Cook Zenith uh, interluminal device specific and general values, depending on whether it's branched or fenestrated. Okay, um, there are two table addenda requests. The first here for transvaginal drainage of the pelvic cavity. So the request was to add the two trans orifice approach values 7 and 8 for the body part value pelvic cavity. And so that's in table uh, 0W9, drainage of general anatomical regions. And there's the, the mock up there where you see the two, two rows and the approaches being added. And then the second table addenda request is for uh, the measurement and monitoring system in table 4A0, measured, measuring just uh, the section for measurement, not for monitoring, but just table 4A0. Uh, we, the request is to create a new qualifier value E compartment and apply it to the musculoskeletal body system value for the percutaneous approach. And this is to allow people to capture the percutaneous needle intercompartmental pressure measurements. So, so measuring compartment syndrome, basically. And the example down there shows where the proposed addition would be in that table. And um, that's it for the agenda. And any comments or questions on any of those? Go ahead, Linda. I have just a comment, which is to thank you. Um, I, I've commented in the past that some of the agenda have been um, uh, unclear to me because um, I wasn't able to think of a, a scenario where it would be used, um, and there weren't specific examples given. Um, under the description. So I noticed that for these two, there are specific examples of when this would be used, and it really does help me to understand why this is necessary and when I would use it. So I just wanted to say thanks. You're welcome. And keep it up. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Moderator, do, would you open the phone lines, please, and we'll take any questions or comments from the phone? All lines have been unmuted. All right, uh, no comments or questions. And what we're gonna do is move on to what looks like a before lunch lecture. <laughs> and it will not be. That's the good news. When we give you the notes ahead of time, then I, I, I wouldn't like to exhaustively go over every bu bullet point. But the idea here, really, I'm, I'm just going to cover some considerations that are in those notes at a very high level, and then we're going to open up uh, the rest of the time till 1230 for any questions or comments that you have at this point. But really, this is just an invitation from CMS to think about to have the wider discussion in an ongoing way in these maintenance meetings, um, it's the kind of thing that we don't get around to because we're very heads down thinking about this proposal and these codes and this proposal and those codes from meeting to meeting. And we, it's hard to um, find a place where we can kind of step back and do a little stock taking. Okay, here's where we are, here's what the structure is, where do we think we wanna go from here? So that's really what this is all about. And there are just a couple general high level things I would point out. Uh, basically, um, the page that Noel has 
listed here on, on pages 48 through 50. It's just to have written for the record some things that are important to keep in mind about the PCS structure. I know uh, in the intervening decades since this was developed, it's nearly 30 years old now. It's actually more than 30 years old, depending on how you count. Um, but people are a lot more used to using spreadsheets and databases as kind of that isn't just a, a, an area for data geeks anymore. But you have to remember that when PCS was first uh, released, the, this, this whole notion of tables and characters and values was pretty radical. You know, the only metaphor that Dr. Mullen could come up with when he was introducing PCS around the world was there were no iPads, remember, no tablets, no nothing. He could say you could pick a code like you pick options on an ATM machine. That's how, that's how crude the technology was at that time. That was the best way of describing what we have here. So it's important just to keep in mind the, the notion of character and value and having something multi-axial built on a database is, is something that was introduced several decades ago and it comes with its own unique characteristics and um, considerations. Okay, um, that's, that's true of PCS. What's true of classification systems generally is that we're always trying to find a, a balance between increasing detail and increasing complexity. You know, several of the discussions today, um, you know, some of the questions kind of touched on that. Well, and, and the fact that we don't have a crystal ball in order to tell if this increasing detail is going to be useful and therefore paying the price of increasing complexity is worth it. So those are all things that are really part of the general, we don't realize that's part of our thinking process when we do it, but um, it's important to keep in mind that that trade-off is what we're negotiating all the time when we're trying to decide. And I mean, I don't mean the royal we, I don't mean CMS, we, I mean all of us as members of the public who, when the individual presenters are done and they go home, the people who are left with the system, <laughs> right? <laughs> because they're the ones who can have this ongoing conversation. Where are we? Where are we going? So where are we? Well, a couple of general points in these notes are that what we've noticed with a couple of update cycles under our belts is that device values are pretty popular, qualifier values are pretty popular. That's where we're getting these requests for um, new detail. And then, you know, a smattering of other types of things from other sections. Okay, and so what you end up with this situation, and there's an example in there from table 0SR, where you have the, yes, thank you, I'm sorry, I, I, sh I should be referring to where we are because um, table 0SR is on page 50. Um, and it gives a, sort of a, a rundown of the history of new detail for device values. Thank you, that's it. So table 0SR, we, we have the starter kit, you know, a lot of, a lot of gen generic general detailed device values were added at the very beginning prior to implementation. And then you see some more specific ones that are specific to hip and knee, and then you see eventually some that are specific to just the knee. Um, and that's, that's just, that's what PCS is for, is to add more value. But we have this creeping level of complexity where device values get more and more specific to certain body parts. But the bottom line is that original structure, everybody, well, everybody who's been here from the beginning can remember the, the good old days where a table was a single row and it, all, it had that new car smell, you know? You just opened it up and it looked so clean. Um, we, we don't have that in a lot of places anymore and you know, that's the price we pay for getting more detail. Um, but 
the thing we need to continue to keep in mind is that those PCS values within one a PCS table, so down to the third character, we used to talk about this in the years before implementation where there was more sort of uh, general discussions of PCS structure um, at this meeting. A, a device value can be used once in a table, regardless of how narrowly it's applied. And that's true of a qualifier value. Okay, so that complexity is an investment you're making in the future. You're, you're sort of saying, we want this level of detail and we think it's gonna be around because we've just spent a device value on it, all right? So just keeping those things in mind, that device values um, and qualifier values can be used once within a table. And that CMS has heard loud and clear, this is also listed in your notes there, that if we delete some codes that have a unique device value or qualifier, nobody wants to see those reused to mean something new in the future. Okay, and then lastly, um, let's go to page 54. Uh, Maddie, Maddie talked briefly about the six, Section X history that, you know, it was added and I think CMS has made this point several times that it can be used to support NTAP, but it, it can be used for other new procedures and technology. Um, it was designed to be flexible and give us sort of a, an overflow valve for things that we're not quite sure we want to invest in putting invest in putting them in, in one of the more permanent sections in PCS. Um, and the other thing I want to bring up is, if you will go to the next page is that section eight, so we have two sections, one that was recently developed um, to, to serve this sort of new technology need, whether it's part of the NTAP program or not. But we also have this section called section eight. And it's kind of a mystery section at the, at the moment. But just pointing out that it is essentially unused. It kind of, it, it served an immediate need in the implementation window where we had to put stuff from ICD-9 that nobody could ever figure out how it got there in the first place, like uh, <laughs> piercing ears and so forth, <laughs> you know. But, um, but just pointing out that we have a section there that's essentially empty. That's pretty much all the things I wanted to point out at a very high level um, that are in these notes, considerations. Um, but at this point, I think I would open it up for any general comments or questions about where we are and how you feel about the, the direction of the evolution of this code set. I know it's a lot to take in, and I know it, it might just be something you want to digest the information in the, in the packet and, and send in written comments, that's fine. Um, go ahead. Lynn Keen, Keen Consulting. I just want to know from you, if you can, how do you envision expanding Section 8 if in the future, if we were to use that for expansion? Absolutely, That's, it's a great question. And I'm not speaking for CMS right now, we're just kind of, uh, so, so <laughs> we're just kind of brainstorming out loud here, this is not an announcement. But just remember, a table, right, a section has, it, it begins, with an eight, right? You have a whole table that begins with an eight. It has one 
section, one body system and one procedure, and all we've used is these very general things that say physiological, whatever it is. I don't know what the second character is, but just, one's a device two. and one's a physiological system or something like that. And then the other thing just says other procedures, okay? So remember, the trade-offs are increasing detail versus complexity. Now, it looks like we've used it all up because we've said there's only one body system and one root operation. But in fact, we just have this little compartment over to the side. We can make whatever root operations we want. We can make whatever body systems we want. Let's say we need some sort of overflow and we've, and um, okay, I will just really do something unwise here, but Let's say we, ha we need a whole root operation for, for nanobot procedures. I mean, we've had three update cycles, and this audience knows as well as anybody that we've already started hearing NCVHS hearings about ICD-11, about what procedure system would go with that. Okay, well, we don't have the crystal ball, but let's just assume we need to use this system for a while. Right? So, what, so it's just thinking creatively. We've got this whole section that hasn't been pinned down. How do we want to spend it? Hi, June Bronner, um, IMO. And I just want to say thank you for having this discussion because I think it is very important, as you pointed out earlier, when you're looking at the proposals, you're looking at that very specific, but it's so important to stay grounded in the fundamentals of the system. So I think this is a great conversation around that and um, really appreciate you presenting this information because it is important um, as we look and go forward with the systems. So, um, and just on uh, one other piece of information that sometimes I find when I'm trying to ground myself back into the system in certain areas is the original reference manual, I think was a way to help do that as well. So just another side comment on that piece, but thank you again. You're very welcome. Thanks, June. And like I said, this is really the beginning of, of sort of an ongoing conversation that sh should be in the back of the minds who, uh, of the people who, I mean, here in the audience, but also um, virtually show up to each of these things and have this kind of concern in mind, as opposed to individual presenters. They want their code and then they, they're gone. so expressive. That's a good way to put it. I mean, they, you're right, they leave and we're still here and we have to deal with this for the next 30 years or whatever it is. They got their code, they're gone and we're standing here holding a very big bag. So um, I, I don't want to scare you, Lynn, but I, I have another thought about like section X or sorry, section eight. We don't have to stop with section eight. Why not create section Q. I'm glad you said that instead of me. Instead of you, right, yeah. I, I wanted to take the bullet for you. I say things like that and I get dirty looks okay. because well, they're like, we're just trying to deal with the sections we have. Well, but it's the thing, true. The thing is, if <clears throat> we're going to have this level of detail and it's being requested by members of the public and also very much by the specialty societies, if they want this level of detail after opposing, relentlessly opposing ICD-10 for, for decades, but if they want this level of detail and we're going to give it to them, we are going to run out of room in sec, you know, existing sections. There's, there's room elsewhere. And I was thinking about the precedent, well, the model set by, for example, the UBO4. They ran out of room in uh, Revenue Code 250, so they created Revenue Code 620. And it 620, it says, you know, I think it's 620. It says, you know, or 630, extension of Revenue Code 250. So maybe we do that in ICD-10 also. Section Q is extension of Section 0 as needed. Right. And then, you know, and it even, it even looks like a zero with a line through it, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. But, but my, my, my point is there's room but, here. Right, right. We just have to get our heads around the concept of you know, having to go back and forth between two sections. That's okay, we already do that with section X. So we'll manage, just a thought. Oh, That's and you know what? I will cede uh, the microphone for my next thought and go back in the line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Um, Thank you. Um, Jean, I just wanted to piggyback on what Linda said because Linda and Lynn, when you're both talking about, you would like to see neuroprotectant eventually a sixth character value in table 3E0. Well, it might end up being a sixth character value in table 3E something. More substances, and we only have, you know, peripheral and central vein body parts in there because we only want to capture injections and infusions, and then we get to start over with the substance values. Um, I literally can't, there are so many rows in Sue Bowman's favorite table, 3E0, <laughs> that you can't just at a glance, I would have to go back and look in the database and see if there is one, if all the 34 values have already been used for those generic substance values, if, if we already are starting to look at overflow tables for more categories of substances like neuroprotectant that are being um, introduced. Go ahead, um, Jean. Jean, uh, Defense Health Agency, and by the way, the military was already used to this because if you tried to find a room at the Pentagon, it's five characters and it says which ring, which floor, which part, you know. So this was a piece of cake. I mean, it was like, yeah, okay, we know this. But um, as an aside, the, um, something that I think we need to think about is um, there are a lot of codes there and I, at least with my organization, have a good time trying to get people to collect something that might be important as opposed to collecting those 3E0 things for all of those vaccinations given to newborns. Like, I don't care that they got a vaccination. No kidding, they probably did, okay? And so I see all of these, I'm sorry, crap codes <laughs> being used over and over and over and filling up my database and I'm going garbage, 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 garbage. Oh, here's something good. Okay, so uh, yeah, we can do this, but boy, trying to get people, and I'm sorry, I know you guys are saying, no, Gene, don't make them do it, but if they have general anesthesia, now that can change a hospitalization to whether they go home now or they have to go home in a couple of days. Getting a vaccination uh, for a newborn, I don't see what it's changing anything, but okay, bad attitude. So I'm, I'm looking at this, trying to get people to collect things that don't change a DRG. And, and I know we can't mention it, but jeepers, that's what they I do didn't the hear code. That. Okay, they collect the, th okay, never mind. I, I just, I'm, I'm looking at what people actually collect. And um, I'm, I'm. It's an open forum, Jean, so <laughs> that's, it's all good. Sue Bowman from AHIMA, and I'm so glad Jean went ahead of me because she set it up perfectly for my comments. But, you know, while we're thinking outside the box and have opened up this whole can of worms, I would just <laughs> like to make the comment that just because you can code something doesn't mean you should. And it doesn't mean that you should create a code in PCS. And I'm not at all opposed to adding section Q or ZZ or whatever when we need to, but I'm not a fan of putting all of the drugs in either Section X or 3E0. I'm a fan of let's figure out a way in our modern, sophisticated, advanced world of coordinating all of the terminologies and coding systems we already have to work together. And we already have device terminologies. We already have drug terminologies. So instead of recreating all of this in PCS, why not look at how we can collect that data from other coding systems and not try to cram everything into PCS. And also, I think we need to look more at how, as Jean was mentioning, this data is being used and if anyone is using it. And I'm not just talking about the, the section X codes that don't become NTAPs and so forth, but some of these imaging procedures and other things. It all sounds great when we're all sitting in here listening to the presenter. I just wonder if anyone is actually assigning those codes or as Jean said, you know, gives a hoot about them or whether they're just sitting there b taking up these characters and values without uh, being used appropriately or necessarily and maybe there would be better, more useful ways of using those. So as part of this whole process, I sort of feel like there needs to be sort of an overarching set of principles 
of how granular we want to be in PCS and what categories of things we're going to capture in PCS versus collecting through some other mechanism. Thank you. That was great. And I don't know, Maddie, do you want to say something here? Because I'm afraid I'll say something that's I can't say. But <laughs> Sue, I, I actually wanted to ask you, do you think this, this meeting, this forum, this federal agency program, the CNM um, cycle is the place to do that, to come up with those high-level standards. I mean, in, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, CMS is doing its job taking every public request for detail and presenting it to this group. So it, it's hard for me to imagine them being both the good cop, bad cop there, right at that point. Well, I mean, they are the PCS maintenance organization, so there is some overarching, you know, responsibility for what should be included in PCS, but I agree that this forum, as well as other stakeholders, might be the appropriate mechanism for coming up with sort of setting some standards so even the, the requesters know what the scope is going to be of what's accepted in PCS, because now I feel like it's sort of like if you build it, they will come, and they do come, and there's, there's no limits, and there's no boundaries for what is considered an acceptable proposal, and so we sort of get, you know, a dumping ground right. of everything somebody wants a code for, whereas it seems like what we need is some sort of boundaries of this is what PCS is for, this is the types of procedures and services we're going to capture in PCS. And yes, these other pieces and, and information, clinical information are important, but they're outside the scope of PCS and are going to be captured and collected through some other mechanism. Okay, thanks. Um, realizing that this forum is open to all the public and anyone can propose a new code, the I want to say there, it, it increases the responsibility to the, the people who c publicly comment in writing after the meetings that say, okay, the answer then just isn't, okay, there's room, so let's add a new code. That's, that's asking the wrong question is what I'm hearing here. The question can't just be, yes, is there room? Oh, okay, we add it. I just wanted to make sure Maddie was okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Nellie. Nellie Lee on Chief St. American Hospital Association. It looks like I actually got behind the right line. Following Jean and Sue, this is my comment. Oh, I guess it got turned off because you already heard where I'm going. It did. Mine's still on. If you want to come up here, I don't. I don't know. Thank you. I thought, you know, I was getting the, the signal that, okay, you know, enough. Um, I, I think that we need to keep in mind there's a cost to collecting this data, assigning all these codes that may or not be something that impact the resources or the clinical outcome of the cases that they get assigned to. And I think that, yes, PCS was intending to be open to anyone that would request a code, but I agree with everything that Jean and Sue have said. We need to have some parameters because I think that we are getting proposals for things that would never be coded in an inpatient setting. And let's face it, I know we're not here to talk about the R word, but in reality, if it doesn't impact outcome, resources, the R word, these codes are not going to ever show up on any claim forms, and that there's a cost to collecting that data. There's a cost to the coders having to review the record and assign the codes. There's a cost to adding the new codes into 
myriads of systems out there. And I realized that the, um, um, the Section 8 codes, when they were created, they were intended to capture things that you were trying to find a home for. And as we look at these things, uh, um, you know, suture removal, you know, let's remember this is an inpatient procedure system. And I agree wholeheartedly with everything that Sue and Jean have said. I mean, y yes, PCS was developed a long time ago, but now we have EHRs that are much more sophisticated and people can get much more detailed clinical information directly from those um, systems. There are device terminologies, there are drug terminologies, there's all kinds of different things. And so let's look at those other options. And I realize that this may not be the body that can make those decisions, but I think that if we develop some parameters that requesters then understand, oh, this is only for procedures. And then we need to kind of define that. Because I mean, you know, when we started going down the path of um, creating codes for uh, administration of oral medications. And I understand also that there's a need if there's going to be an NTAB application that maybe someone needs to know that. But if, if we don't, I mean, when did we ever code for oral medications in the past? I mean, in the inpatient setting, when did we code for imaging? And so, you know, as we go down this path, it's like we're adding in more and more values and new codes for things that may never be used. And then, you know, when we do need them for real procedures, real surgeries that we want to collect information on, we're going to be sort of strapped into um, tinkering with the system where it, they're going to end up running out of space and putting them in things that are not related. So I think that um, for us, for this group, we need to develop some clear guidance for the requesters in terms of what's in scope and what's not in scope for a, a procedure classification system. Thank you. Thanks, Nellie. Hi, my name is Adi Renbaum from a and Consulting, and I here wholeheartedly swear not to be a certified coder. In fact, you might call me a coding groupie more than a coding <laughs> expert of any kind. Um, but I, I do want to bring a different perspective um, for you all to contemplate, uh, and that is from the AMA CPT process, which is that um, the AMA CPT panel um, reviews codes every five years or so. Most of the CPT codes every five years, there are all kinds of rules and structures around which codes and when, and most times, uh, and they're looking for volume and utilization in order to um, perhaps retire codes where certain procedures aren't conducted anymore, they've been replaced, you know, or just, um, retired in terms of practice, clinical practice, and so some codes may be retired. Those RVUs are, you know, re, re, reinvested or reharvested or whatever. But there is a process for that, and there's an expectation, particularly with new technology codes, that those will be reviewed every three years to see if, in fact, they've sort of taken root in the clinical community, if they're being used, um, and if they're not, to sort of, you know, cull them from from the existing, you know, set of codes. So just as an idea of sort of a different platform of, of coding, procedure coding, that maybe, perhaps you're already doing that, I don't know, but just as a, as a way to think about it from a different perspective. Thank you. Well, Jean, Defense Health Agency. Um, okay, here it is. I, I'm an analyst, and, and so you get all these newbie analysts, and, and they go and they look in the PCS book and they go, wow, look, there's this procedure. We can see how many people um, collected breast milk. And, and, and it's not coded, and they claim that nobody did it. And, and so not only is there a problem with what the heck was it doing there in the first place, but um, the thing is coders don't, or analysts don't realize that nobody collects that puppy, even though it might have happened. Um, and so, of course, it's not going to show up. And so then you get these silly reports, and you're, you have to quick call them and say, no, no, don't do that, okay? And so if you have a code that um, an, a, somebody, an analyst, can see, the analyst is, is naively going to think that it would be used if it actually happened, okay? So we've got to be careful about that. 
And then the other thing is, um, I think Maddie's the one, maybe it was Cindy Hake who put me in connection with Gladys. Uh, but, um, you know, right now we have the, the designated maintenance organizations for the HIPAA standard transactions, and this code set is one of the HIPAA standard code sets. And, um, and there are lots of things, like a sane nurse, you know, if somebody comes in with an alleged uh, rape and a sane nurse does something, uh, guess what? I don't have a HIPAA taxonomy to use for that person because who would bill it? Because it's a legal thing. But would it be nice to know? Well, maybe. Well, the thing is you can't get them paid because they say, well, that's not a to a, a, a hospital or you know, a health insurance company isn't going to pay for that, and you're darn right, but there's legislation that it says that the uh, entity where it occurred will pay for it, the, the jurisdiction will pay for it. So there's all kinds of legal things, there's all kinds of occupational health things, and, and so, um, you know, it's, it's the, there's a, Sue, you might not like this, but there's a possibility of a new code set that has something to do with these implantable devices uh, and having the barcodes or, because I know there's the facility codes, but the DRGs aren't really the same. Oh, wait, I didn't say that. But I'm just saying that some of this stuff belongs in a totally new code set, and, and so we shouldn't be putting it here. Just one of those things. Um, okay. Hi, June Bronner. I am just um, briefly wanted to say I agree with both Sue and Nellie's comments and the parameters and the guidelines uh, for, uh, for the system. And I also think not only would it help the requesters, but it also help as you are commenting to know that these are the parameters of, um, of that system and just along the same line. So just want to say I agree with their comments. Okay. And everybody's remembering what they said so you can reproduce this in written form for... CMS. Go ahead, Lynn. Lynn Keen, Keen Consulting. Um, I have two things. First of all, um, I do want us to remember, because as Sue mentioned, there's a lot of things in the system that we really don't code, but we have other countries that have adopted PCS as their procedure code set and have not adopted CPT, and they actually need those things. So it's, uh, it's there for a reason, and we, we may not appreciate it, but others may appreciate it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that I wanted to thank, I'm not sure, CMS, you, whoever, Rhonda, whoever did the work this year for our update that deleted the things that were not clinically possible. I like to call those codes, when would you ever do those things? <laughs> and I explain to people, you just can't physically do them. I think there is some additional opportunity in medical and surgical to look at some of the procedures that are just there because they thought we might need them. I'm not, I don't have an exact example for you, but I just want to encourage the continued look at combinations of body parts and uh, approaches and potentially devices and qualifiers where they may not be clinically valid. And um, I have to do some work on that myself and perhaps suggest some of these things to you to be looked at. But that has been vitally important this year. I, I can't tell you how many people ask me about breast procedures, of how you would do that externally, and I'm so glad that that is solved. But. Um, those are the types of things that historically were out there, but as our knowledge of PCS has grown, we've come to understand that really you can't do a breast procedure externally. And that the code set could use the occasional overall look like they do with CPT, the every five years, and not necessarily to delete things, but systematically just make sure that if nothing has been ever assigned to that code, it may be one of these clinically invalid things where you just can't do it. Uh, and, and I think that's vitally important for the data. And as, as an instructor, 
I, I get those questions constantly. Could you give me an example of what you'd use this combination for? Many times I can pull out an example, but sometimes I just can't find a valid situation to use it. So I kind of call those garbage codes. Sorry. They just seem oh. to be there and not usable. Those are all really um, appreciate you saying that stuff from the podium. And, and I think it's especially important to distinguish between the kinds of things that you're saying are on its face clinically invalid as opposed to that technology hasn't been developed yet. In other words, we can't do that that non-invasively yet. You know, we don't have uh, percutaneous joint replacement yet. Yeah. <laughs> but, but just keep in mind, it, it, you know, a massive undertaking to look at all the tables, which were, as I said, it, when it was first developed and released. It was my Bigger. There was no there was no clear set understanding of how this this would be used. It it might not have even been multiplied out into combinations of codes with code titles. We might have just had the tables. We didn't know what the formatting conventions for these codes. So so that whole exercise of multiplying out all possible combinations and saying CMS in their wisdom imagined the procedure that this code represents. That's never been a feature of PCS. So, you True. know, your newer coders are just uh, torturing themselves with that exercise. True. Because that isn't, that isn't how PCS was designed. It was designed top down, not and bottom I'm not, up. I'm not advocating willy-nilly deleting anything. And a, a great example of that is that we looked at the cabbage tables for a long time and said, when could you ever do a percutaneous endoscopic cabbage? And I'm presenting that at AHIMA because they're doing it. They have found a way, so they will. Never, um, <laughs> one of my biggest problems with code sets in general is that they don't have enough laparoscopic options and these doctors are creating ways to do them constantly. I'm, I'm just talking about a thank you for this three major categories that were fixed this time, and please don't hesitate to do that again in the future and say, yeah, we found, you just can't do this. So, thanks. Thank you. Maddie, do we have a, a stop time? Please? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I'm just imagining the video, you know, it's been like, yeah, go Rhonda. Ahead. Go ahead, Linda. Sure. Yeah, we can we can take a, a couple more. I'll try to make this quick, Rhonda. Um, I I just wanted to go back to my comment earlier, where Maddie said she could see the wheels turning. They turned slowly, so it's been like two hours, but they they did finally turn. Um, it, it's a, about the uh, adjunctive steps that may become standard of care. I really wonder about creating codes for that. I mean, obviously, if you find a way to do a percutaneous heart transplant or something like that, we need a new code, okay? Um, but if you're, I mean, th that's a primary procedure. If you're talking about some sort of adjunctive step that uh, helps enable that procedure or, you know, makes it, uh, uh, is a clinical improvement on how the procedure is done or something like that, and that then becomes the standard of care, why do we need a code for some kind of, of, of adjunct? Um, I don't, I don't, I mean, they did leave, so I'm free to, to say this publicly. I don't think we do. If they want data on how that's working, they can go pay for it. You know, they can do their own studies, as opposed to asking 50,000 coders to collect it for them for free, so and to speak. And hoping that having the data, they can make their technology the standard of care. Is that what you're saying? So it's aspirational. They, it's not on its way to becoming the standard of care, but they're hoping to use the code set to establish that it should be? I don't, I don't want to put any motives to them. Okay. I'm just saying that if you, can, if you have an adjunctive step and you can see that becoming a standard of care, I, I don't know that it needs a new code. It may be one of those things where perhaps you could put it in section X and then it'll just quietly wither away. But that, that leads to my next point, which is um, about frequency. I mean, um, Sue said, and I think you said it several years ago, 
that just because there's a code doesn't mean you need to assign it, and you are both right about that. I think I clapped when you said it too. Um, but, uh, but there's another, there's a reverse to that too, which is just because something is assigned infrequently doesn't mean it doesn't add value. Um, and our friends over from uh, CDC know that I'm constantly complaining about, well not complaining, constantly commenting on um, just because the disease is rare doesn't mean it shouldn't have a code because you want to be able to identify it when that rare disease does happen and, and involves very high resources. It's useful, genuinely useful um, to be able to identify it specifically. So it's, it's the same thing here. Um, the frequency data is, is, is good to know, but it, there are several sides to it. You know, there, people are using those uh, Section X codes more frequently now. It may be that they're seeing it more, or it may be that because it's there, they're using it. Be, because we built it, they came, right? It, so it gets back to Sue and, and Nellie's points and the many other excellent points made here. Is it useful? And maybe it isn't. Just because it's frequent doesn't mean it's useful. And just because it's infrequent doesn't mean it isn't useful. So that's one factor, the frequency, but there's others that we have to, we have to consider as well. Useful is defined by you as a meaningful distinction in the data? Actually, useful? I liked Nellie's definition, okay. um, which is, um, uh, does it affect outcomes? Does it affect resources? Um, is it something that, that people um, want to know? distinctly, separately. Gene also had a definition for useful, which was very similar to that. And also, is it, is it something that's going to be useful going forward, far forward? The crystal ball problem. Right. So We don't know if something's going to become the standard care or if it's really important to capture until we capture it and see if it was. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But it's, a, it's, a, it's another factor to, mm -hmm. to just bear in mind. I'll, I'll keep those wheels moving, too. So... But I'm sure everybody wants to eat now. Thank you very much, everyone, for your participation. And um, I'm sure the written comments will be at least as interesting. And having digested this and thought about what your colleagues here have said, um, we look forward to hearing more and having, having this discussion continue. I just want to thank Rhonda again for that uh, great discussion and we, we've been wanting to, to do that for some time but as you know, th th these things take time. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank everybody for their great comments. I think it um, was a great discussion and I try to scribble down as many notes as I can but at least we do have the recording so we can go back and again just to um, emphasize that we do need to have your comments in writing submitted to that email address. So. Um, at this time, I'm just going to go over a couple minor announcements. Um, the first one is that um, we were um, informed that there was a issue with the fiscal year 2020 hospital acquired condition or hack list. There were some codes listed under Hack 5 for falls and trauma that should not have been included. So we have updated that list. And as a result, we will be posting an updated definitions manual to reflect those changes. So um, it, it just had to do with some codes, the fracture codes that included the subsequent encounter qualifier that accidentally got included. So I just wanted to let everybody know that. The second thing is, I know a lot of people have been um, wondering about the PC grouper software and when that would be made available. So I can just share with you that it will be made available at the end of this month. Okay, so it will be posted on our website. So you can rejoice a little about that. <laughs> 
And then also, beginning with the March meeting, we're hoping to have live a new listserv. Uh, we've had this uh, older NIH ICD-9-CM listserv for many years now, and we did uh, transfer, I guess if that's the right word, to an ICD-10 um, domain and listserv, but it's just taking a little bit of time to get that up and running. So um, if we do get that ready to go by the March meeting, then we'll have um, instructions on how to join that listserv so that you can continue to get announcements and things about when um, materials are made available for the meeting and when comments are due, those little reminders that are sent out. Okay, and I don't know if Donna wanted to go over a couple of announcements before we break for lunch. Okay, Donna has a, a couple things she would like to announce as well. And just a reminder, we'll be breaking for lunch from 12.30 to 1.30, at which time CDC will begin the diagnosis code topic discussions. Actually, this is a quick follow-on. Uh, well, I guess I should introduce myself, even though Maddie did. I'm Donna Pickett, National Center for Health Statistics, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And you'll be seeing staff this afternoon presenting the diagnosis uh, portion of the meeting, and the rest will continue tomorrow. But relative to the files, uh, one, we do have a new listserv. As Maddie was indicating, pretty much all of HHS is migrating to a different delivery system, and we've done the same. And so when, as we post new files, uh, we encourage you to sign up for the listserv to make sure that you are getting the notices that you would like to receive and not just calling us individually to say, when are you posting? Um, please sign up for the new listserv. If you're not sure if you have, there is a link to, from our webpage to get you there. Um, and so you have support if you run into problems trying to sign up. Um, for the uh, conversion table, we did post an updated conversion table. However, we are about to post another updated conversion table. Part of our issues are, as we try to make things, uh, the files that we post available in an accessible format, it sometimes um, disrupts things, and so the files end up looking a little squirrely, as someone has described it to me. Um, and we have to go back and, and you know, finesse them and, and get them to work properly so that you're seeing what you need to see. But again, if you're signed up with the listserv, when we post the new files, you will get an indication of when those files are available. Um, and for those of you who would also ask questions about some of the PowerPoint presentations that uh, were done for the March meeting and some of the PowerPoint presentations you'll see as part of today and tomorrow's presentations, we do work very hard to get those accessible as well. We are not allowed to post, as you've heard before, we're not allowed to post non-508 compliant um, uh, files and PowerPoint presentations. So we do endeavor to get those things up as quickly as we can, but a lot of times it does mean going back to the submitters um, to help them help us remediate the problem so that we can post. So um, it's not that we've forgotten. It's not that we know that, you know, we don't think that these are important. They are, but again, we have a process that we have to follow to make sure that um, they are handicap accessible as we are required to do. Um, the rest of the announcements, um, we will make the formal announcements as part of tomorrow's meeting. There are a lot of people that I know were not participating today either um, on the phone lines or here in the audience that are interested in the diagnosis. So rather than repeat things twice, we will do all of the updates related to diagnosis and the timelines as part of tomorrow's presentations. Um, and with that, Maddie, can we go ahead and... Close it. So with that, we are going to close now and break for lunch, and we'll be coming back at 1.30. Yep. So enjoy lunch. Bon appetit. <laughs>